Our memories by Northwest Federal Savings and Loan Association, by Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and by Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. This is Chuck Shaden with another in our series of programs designed to bridge the sound gap between yesterday and today. Today is Saturday, September 2nd, 1978. It's the beginning of the Labor Day weekend, and this afternoon, on Those Were the Days, we'll take an audio trip over the rainbow for a remote from the land of Oz as we present the stars of MGM's The Wizard of Oz as they were heard on various radio appearances in the 1930s and 40s. We'll hear from Judy Garland, Ray Bolger, Bert Lahr, Jack Haley, Frank Morgan, and Billy Burke, and we'll have some fond memories about the movie and the stars. So stay tuned and don't touch that dial. It all begins right after this word from Northwest Federal Savings. Now, Northwest Federal Savings has two new ways to help you get more for your savings dollar. There's our high-interest 8% eight-year savings certificate and our T-Market certificate. The eight-year savings certificate pays 8% annual interest on deposits of $1,000 or more. Compounded daily, it has an effective yield of 8.45%. Another new way to save is our T-Market certificate. It's a six-month savings certificate for investments of $10,000 or more, with interest one quarter percent higher than the latest average weekly auction yield of six-month treasury bills. That's one quarter percent more than banks can pay on similar investments. There are no extra fees or service charges. Federal regulations require a substantial penalty for early withdrawal. See a savings counselor at any Northwest Federal Savings Center for more information about our two new ways to save. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. And we have a good time in store for us tonight at uh, Northwest Federal Savings. Indeed, we do. We have a uh, we have a double feature going tonight. We're starting a a two week B movie festival. You know what a, mo- a B movie is? A B movie is a little programmer picture, uh, low budget mostly. Uh, uh, ran about an hour long and uh, was uh, the bottom half of the bill of the double features back in the 1930s and the 1940s. Well, it's Western night tonight, and we have two B movies for you. And don't don't uh, get me wrong; the B movies were not bad movies. They were usually very good films, uh, tightly done, uh, fast-paced, and uh, very uh, very good to see, good to watch. Tonight we have Destry Rides Again from 1932, starring Tom Mix, plus the boss of Hangtown Mesa from 1942, starring Johnny Mac Brown and Al Fuzzy Knight. Boy, oh boy, we got a good double feature. If you like shoot 'em up westerns with a lot of action and none of that gooey, mushy love stuff, you'll get it in this uh, double feature tonight. <laughs> Destry Rides Again with Tom Mix and the boss of Hangtown Mesa with Johnny Mac Brown and Al Fuzzy Knight. At our memory movie over at Northwest Federal Savings Irving Park Community Center Auditorium. That's at 4901 Irving Park Road in Chicago. Doors open at 730 The film, the double feature, will begin promptly at 8 o'clock this evening, and donation is a dollar and a quarter a person with all proceeds donated to recognized charities. So we're going to be there tonight, and we hope that you will join us. You want to see a good Western double feature, a good way to have a holiday weekend uh, cooking for you. Uh, Join us for Johnny Mac Brown and Tom Mix. I bet you never saw Tom Mix on the screen, huh? Only the real old-timers. Only us real (laughs) old-timers have seen Tom Mix on the screen. Well, he's not going to be there with the Ralston straight shooters. This is the real, honest to goodness Tom Mix tonight, and uh, Johnny Mac Brown too. I know there's a lot of folks going to be there for this, so why don't you come on and have a good time at the Memory Movie at Northwest Federal on Irving Park Road tonight at eight o'clock. So we'll have a, a really good time with that. Well, this afternoon our um, our theme, if you will, is uh, the Wizard of Oz, and we have uh, in store for you. Um, an interesting array of radio programs uh, presented originally after The Wizard of Oz was um, was first released by Metro Golden Mayor. And uh, we're going to have some fun as we listen to these various Wizard of Oz personalities. Judy Garland, who was Dorothy, Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow, Jack Haley, the Tin Man, Bert Lahr, the Cowardly Lion, Frank Morgan, the Wizard, and Billy Burke, Galinda, the nice witch, the nice witch. Uh, 
we're going to have those people on radio in their own radio shows or as a guest on some other radio show. I think you'll find it entertaining and interesting and delightful. But to get you in the proper mood, as Judy did at the very top of the show today, we're going to take you back to the radio days of 1939 when the Wizard of Oz was first out and the radio uh, people were promoting, uh, MGM was promoting the Wizard of Oz and they supplied to radio stations all over the country a little uh, 12-minute program called Leo is on the Air, Leo being Leo the Lion. And Leo is on the Air is a program that highlighted the new movies coming out of Metro Golden Mare. Boy, I want to say Metro Golden Memories all the time. This is a radio preview of the exciting film, the exciting new film, The Wizard of Oz. Leo is on the air. Golden Mayor joins the world in celebrating the golden jubilee of motion pictures and climaxes a half century of entertainment progress by announcing the early exhibition of its miracle in celluloid, the Technicolor Extravaganza, The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Great was the wizard as he booked that more than 10 million copies reached eager hands and eager hearts. So entrancing was the wizard as a musical attraction that Broadway held it for four solid years, after which it toured 941 American cities for even more record-breaking years. But it is as a motion picture that the Wizard of Oz reaches the full brilliance of its glory. Its colorful beauty and the sheer warmth of its simple story are matched only by the fineness of its unforgettable music. This preview of its delightful and long-anticipated score begins with Judy Garland's mellow voicing of Over the Rainbow. One of the outstanding technicolorful spectacles in The Wizard of Oz is the gala celebration in the Emerald City. Let's tune in on it as the happy-go-lucky citizens of that amazing country go to town lyrically 
with the merry old land of ours. Ho, 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 and a couple of tra la laws. That's how we laugh the day away in the merry old land of ours. remember Dorothy's visit to Munchkinland. She is given a royal welcome by the little Munchkins and hastens off to join the fabulous wizard himself. The Munchkins point the way to Oz and in their funny, pipey little voices tell Dorothy to follow the yellow brick road. 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 some very interesting companions indeed who join her on the amazing journey to us. First, she meets the Scarecrow, played by Ray Bolger. Then, the Tin Man, played by Jack Haley. And finally, the Cowardly Lion, played by Bert Lahr. Each of her friends, Dorothy finds, has his troubles, and all hope that the mighty wizard will solve them. But suppose we let them speak, or rather, sing for themselves. I could while away the hours Conferring with the flowers, consulting with the rain. And my head, I'd be scratching while my thoughts were busy hatching if I only had a brain. <laughs> I'd unravel every riddle for any individual in trouble or in pain. With the thoughts you'd be thinking you could be another Lincoln if you only had a brain. Oh, I... Tell you why the ocean's near the shore. I could think of things I never thought before. And then I'd sit and think some more. I would not be just a nothing, my head all full of stuffing, my heart all full of pain. I would dance and be merry, life would be a ding a dairy if I only had a brain. When a man's an empty kettle, he should be on his mettle, and yet I'm torn apart. 
Just because I'm presuming that I could be kind of human if I only had a heart. I'd be tender, I'd be gentle, and awful sentimental regarding love and art. I'd be friends with the sparrows and the boy who shoots the arrows if I only had a heart. Picture me a balcony above a voice sing low. Where's the light now? Romeo. I hear a beat. How sweet just to register emotion, jealousy, devotion, and really feel the part. I could stay young and chipper, and I'd lock it with a zipper if I only had a heart. Yeah, it's sad, believe me, Missy, when you're born to be a sissy without the feminine five. But I could show my prowess, be a lion, not a mouse, if I only had the nerve. I'm afraid there's no denying I'm just a dandelion A fate I don't deserve I'd be brave as a blizzard I'd be gentle as a lizard I'd be clever as a gizzard If the wizard is a wizard Who will serve? Then I'm sure to get a brain A heart <laughs> The knife Oh, we're up to see the wizard the magnificent musical spectacle which highlights the new entertainment season. That's the Wizard of Oz. A glorious extravaganza painted with the rainbow of Technicolor. With a cast of thousands, at a cost of millions, it is brought to you by metro golden Mayor, makers of the great Ziegfeld and Broadway Melody, and presented as a greater attraction than even those two pace-setting entertainments. From border to border and coast to coast, they're calling the Wizard of Oz the sensation of the year. This is your MGM radio reporter signing off, thanking you for listening, and hoping you will enjoy The Wizard of Oz when it comes your way. is on the air, a radio preview of the brand new MGM Technicolor Extravaganza, The Wizard of Oz, back in 1939. Your radio reporter there, uh, who also uh, narrated a great many of the MGM uh, previews of coming attractions, the, the trailers that they used to have in advance of the feature, uh, said that this was um, the big new hit of the year, and uh, for almost 40 years that has been a big hit of the year. I don't know if there's hardly a, if there's a person alive who hasn't ever seen The Wizard of Oz, at least in the United States, and I know all around the world they've shown The Wizard of Oz, too. And of course, here we have television, and every year um, it's usually in the early springtime when they show The Wizard of Oz. It's usually in March or so. It's not Easter yet, but it's sometime in the early spring when they, they show it on a Sunday, late Sunday afternoon, usually, and it's uh, it continues to pile up the biggest audience ever. The Wizard of Oz, a fantastic motion picture, and the stars of that motion picture will demonstrate their radio versatility throughout this afternoon as we share with you from our Hall Closet collection of old-time radio shows the, uh, um, the broadcast featuring Judy Garland, Ray Bolger, Jack Haley, Bert Lahr, Frank Morgan, and... Uh, Billy Burke. So we have a lot of this stuff for you. I'm Chuck Shaden. Our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago, FM 97. 
Remember Henry Ford's Model T? Remember cranking up the motor to start the car? And do you remember the Model A with the self-starter? You recall World War II gas rationing and those little A and B stickers you had to display on your windshield? Those are great memories, aren't they? Well, Ralph Hirschberg of Nelson Hirschberg Ford has fond memories, too, some that roll back to 1931 when he and Norm Nelson first started selling Fords on Irving Park Road. Today, Ralph and Jurgen and all the folks at Nelson Hirschberg Ford remember one other thing, that during all those years, the Ford owner who comes again to get his new Ford from Nelson Hirschberg is the Ford owner who's been treated with old-fashioned respect and courtesy, not only when he buys that new Ford, but while he owns it, too. Thousands of Ford owners come back again and again to do business with Nelson Hirschberg, one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers. Find out for yourself. Get your new Ford from an old-fashioned dealer. Visit Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 Irving Park Road, five blocks west of Cicero at Laramie. Now to begin our uh, look at um, the stars of The Wizard of Oz, uh, we're going back to the 1940s for an Armed Forces radio broadcast entitled Mail Call. This was one of a number of variety shows produced stateside for the guys in the service all around the world, uh, bringing you a variety of stars and a good uh, musical and comedy entertainment. On this particular Mail Call program from the 40s, Judy Garland is Mistress of Ceremonies, uh, Don Wilson is the announcer, uh, Bob Hope is the guest on this show. You'll hear as we roll along the Merrimax in this, Carmen Cavallero and the orchestra. Uh, Frank Nelson is in this too. You'll recognize his, uh, his voice. I think you'll enjoy uh, listening in to Mail Call, starring uh, the little girl from uh, Kansas who grew up to entertain the servicemen, Judy Garland. Crawl from the United States of America. <laughs> Stand by, Americans. Here's mail call. One big package of words and music and laughter delivered to you by the stars from whom you want to hear in answer to the request you send to Armed Forces Radio, Los Angeles, USA. In response to your many persistent letters, fellas, this mail call is going to be supervised by one of the loveliest girls of the screen, MGM singing star, Judy Garland. Can 
be a dying ember. Love can be a flame. Love fresh as the morning may be wild when it's morning. Thank you, Don. And now, uh, what's next, Judy? Well, Don, I've been peeking in that big sack of mail that pours into the Armed Forces Radio Service from overseas, and there was one particular singing group who had a lot of mail stacked up. Well, I couldn't mean any other than those masters of harmony, the Mary Max, singing Stand and In the Need of Prayer. <laughs> Sister, not my brother, but it's me, me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I've got chillin' I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's me. Max, that was really merry. And now for all you guys and gals out there who like to hear 88 keys ripple, here's real talent. The toast of New York's smart nightclubs, that wizard of the ivories, Carmen Caballero. <laughs>
Carmen Cavallero on the keyboard there on this mail call program from the 1940s uh, with Judy Garland from The Wizard of Oz a few years later as Mistress of Ceremonies on this show. We'll get back to it in just a moment. I'm Chuck Shaden with you every Saturday afternoon from 1 until 5 here on WNIB Chicago FM 97 are those with a day's program providing for you some good entertainment from not really so long ago. If you can remember it, we've got it. And if you never heard of it, sometimes we've got that too. Who knows? Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womat. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where you'll find quality merchandise for the entire family. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. Easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Many fine stores open to serve you seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. Before we get back to Judy Garland in the mail call program, I want to remind you about our custom cassette service that we have inaugurated about a month or so now, six weeks perhaps. Many times people call and say they heard a program that we broadcast on the air and uh, they said they were trying to tape it and they, they flubbed the dub, you know, they missed it, or they uh, someone was supposed to copy it for them and... Uh, uh, they they blew it, uh, or we'll get a call from a wife, and uh, she'll say, unless I can get a copy of this show some way, I'm going to have to go to, div to the divorce court because my husband said under penalty of death I had to tape this thing. It's been difficult for us to uh, to make a custom tape recording for you, but now we've put the mechanics of it all together and have said if you want a copy of a show that we have broadcast either currently or any time in the past and if you know enough information about the show to identify it to us we will be more than happy to make a custom cassette tape recording of that show for you the fee for this service is six dollars and fifty cents per half hour program so if there's a half hour show that you want six fifty we'll make a custom recording of it if you can give us the information about the show that you want in other words if you want it uh, uh, mail call program from the 1940s, Judy Garland, Bob Hope, and so forth, and then you say it was broadcast on Those Were the Days on September 2nd of 1978. That kind of information. We'll be more than happy to make a custom cassette tape for you from our broadcast master, so you'll be getting very good quality, uh, as good a quality as our master is at any rate. And then we do it on the same kind of tape, the same quality tape that is used in our cassette tape of the month, too. So if you would like to take advantage of this service, if you don't uh, make a copy of the show when it is being broadcast, uh, we'll be happy to oblige. Six fifty per half hour. You can send that amount along with all the information that you can possibly give us on the program that you want to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. And if you need more information about this, don't hesitate. Give us a call while we're on the air here at our studio at 545-2260. Now let's get back to Judy Garland and Mail Call. Say, uh, Judy. Yes, Don. You know, Judy, what I've been thinking all evening, here you are, Mr. of Ceremonies on a big radio show, and yet it was only just a few years ago that you first arrived here in Hollywood. Yes, Don, Hollywood's been very, very good to me. Well, I guess you've got just about everything that a girl could want. Well, I, I have been lucky, Don, but I, I still haven't got the one thing I've always dreamed about. What do you mean? Don't you remember? I'll, I'll tell you if you'll listen. Dear Mr. Gable, I am writing this to you, and I hope that you will read it so you'll know. Heart beats like a hammer, and I stutter and I stammer every time I see you at the picture show. I guess I'm just another fan of yours, and I thought I'd write and tell you so. You may. I didn't want to do it, I didn't want to do it, you made me love you, and all the time you knew it, I guess you always knew it, you made me happy sometimes, you made me glad. I didn't want to tell you 
very mention of your name sends my heart reeling. You know you made me love you. You see what I mean, Don? I've wished there, and wished for him. There, there, Judy. Your wish will come true. You really think so? Well, certainly. Why, who knows? Maybe the door will open this very minute and Clark Gable will walk in. Oh, if he only would. Don, you don't suppose? Come in, come in! Quiet, Bob! Oh! Well, hello, Judy. Hello, Don. Oh. What's wrong? Well, uh, Bob, you know, uh... Turn on the heating system. What is it? Huh? Well, Bob, Judy was just sort of hoping that it would be Clark Gable. Oh, I'm sorry, Judy. I'm in the wrong studio. I'll check. Oh, oh no, Bob. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Please don't go. Oh, but I'm Bob Hope, and you wanted Clark Gable. I know, but people get used to margarine instead of butter. <laughs> Please stay. No, I'm not kidding myself, Judy. I'm no Clark Gable, and I know it. Well, now, don't say that, Bob. That's not true. Why, name one thing that Clark Gable's got that you haven't got. Women. <laughs> now, you don't have to make me feel good, Judy. No, Bob, I'm serious. You and Mr. Gable are similar in many respects. You really think so? Of course. Why, well, you're both... You, you both... <laughs> well, you're both men. <laughs> Flattery will get you no place, Judy. <laughs> Just be running along, if no, you don't mind. Now, wait, Bob, I, I'm afraid I've hurt you. Oh, that's all right. No, you, you, you've got that hurt look in your eyes. It's not your fault. I strained them yesterday going through Esquire. <laughs> oh, I... They've cut a lot of stuff, haven't they? <laughs> See why you won't listen well, to me. Well, it's no use, Judy. How can I hope to compete with Clark Gable? All the women love those beautiful big ears of his. <laughs> oh, well, don't you worry, Bob. Your nose is as big as both of them put together. No. <laughs> now, I'll, make a I'll make a confession, Bob. I've, I've often dreamed about you, too. You have? Uh-huh. You know, sometimes you're a, you're a knight in shining armor, and sometimes you're a cowboy riding out on the plains, and... Then other times you're a Northwest Mountie roaming a frozen wilderness. Don't I ever go out with anybody but a horse? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Judy, you better forget me. I'm not for you. You know my reputation in this town. I'm a wolf. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not a wolf. You're sweet and innocent and noble and pure. <laughs> Have you talked to any girls or old carols lately? <laughs> Almost got the laugh there, you know that. <laughs> I don't care what. It's a straight line. <laughs> You're sweet and innocent, noble, but sure. I thought you were going to pull out a bladder for a minute. It's all right. I may, get, I may have a spot in here later. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are you ready? I carry a grudge, you know. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't care what anybody says. I know an honest man when I see one. Judy, please. <laughs> it's true. You're a square shooter. Look at that square jaw. Look at those square shoulders. <coughs> oh, Judy. I mean it. I think you're the biggest square I ever met. <laughs> no, Judy, all those people don't call me a wolf for nothing. I'm a pretty cynical man of the world. Oh, no, you're not. You, you've just built up a hard shell to protect yourself with from the outside world, but underneath that hard shell, you're soft and mushy. <laughs> what am I, a man or an oyster? What is it? <laughs> Don't you believe what you read in the papers? I'm at Ciro's with Lorraine Bacall one night. I'm at Ramanoff's with Lana Turner the next. Then I'm in the Coconut Grove with Ann Sheridan. <laughs> I know. I've seen those items, but I know they're not true. Why, a man of your age wouldn't have that much energy. <laughs> like a straight line of rehearsal. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Judy. I'm not that old. <laughs> well, no, no. I, I didn't mean 
mean you were real old, like Ben Crosby. Yeah. <laughs> Please, let's leave Barbara Fritchie's boyfriend out of it. <laughs> No matter what you say, you'll never convince me that you're a wolf, Bob. I trust you. And if you stopped your car out on the dark street and said you were out of gas, I'd believe you implicitly. You would, really? Yes. Yeah. Doing anything tonight, Judy? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just to show you how I trust you, I will go out with you tonight. You will? <laughs> oh, Bob, I didn't know you did imitations of Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> No cocker spaniel, believe me. Well, Judy, since you're the outdoor type, I suppose you like sports. Oh, yes. Baseball, golf, swimming, fishing. How about sailing? You like sailing? Love it. Well, I'm each in the tunnel of love. Third boat from the end. I'll meet you later. Another segment of Mail Call for Armed Forces Radio back in the 1940s with Judy Garland as Mistress of Ceremonies. We'll get back to that in just about a minute. This is Chuck Shaden with you every Saturday from 1 to 5 on WNIB Chicago. This is FM 97 where you hear our Those Were the Days program from uh, start to finish if you join us from all that time. You buy with confidence when you get the townhouse guarantee from townhouse TV and appliances. Why don't you give them a try? They won't be undersold and you won't be underserviced shop around, get the best deal possible, then visit Townhouse. Townhouse guarantees that you'll get the best price on the hundreds of Frigidaire refrigerators and washers, dryers, and ranges in stock. And, oh, there's more. Townhouse guarantees to make delivery on the day promised, guarantees normal installation on all products delivered, guarantees to move your old appliance to the basement or the garage or to remove it from the premises, if you like. I was over at Townhouse the other day talking to Mike Moore about the uh, videotapes and all that sort of stuff and I tell you I really was I really got knocked out on something there I was standing uh, in the back a little bit and there was a uh, there was an a, a range I guess it was a a Frigidaire range there and it was in kind of a, um, a yellow yellow you know the, the uh, porcelain was yellow okay and there was a big note stuck on there, and it said, Change to Poppy Red. <laughs> you may remember a year or so ago when Mike Moore had purchased a whole bunch of Poppy Red uh, washers and dryers, and he said uh, he made a special deal. They had just overproduced Poppy Red color because there was not the biggest market in the world for Poppy Red. And then a lot of people said, well, if I can save some money, I'll buy Poppy Red. And you put a washer and a dryer down in the basement. doesn't make any difference. And he said, believe it or not, a lot of people do like Poppy Red as a color. And here's someone who had bought the Poppy Red washer and dryer. And then they bought a Poppy Red refrigerator and all that. Now, 
they they weren't they had discontinued poppy red <laughs> but they they had the panels uh, apparently on the range you can just take all that all that off and just put the, you know they put the the guts on it and you put the new stuff on it so poppy red this was being changed to poppy red this is just kind of one of those funny things that certainly isn't funny to you if you don't know what I'm talking about but that's the way it is townhouse nice place townhouse tv and appliances 7243 Tui avenue just west of Harlem. They're open Monday and Thursday and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Now back to mail call. Say, Bob. Yes, Judy? You know, it was very funny you were mentioning the Tunnel of Love before. Why, what do you mean? Well, the first date I ever had, the fellow wanted to take me to the Tunnel of Love. On his first date with you? Yes. Gee, right into combat with no basic training. <laughs> Forget that, boy. What a character. I know just the kind of guy you mean. I'll give you two to one he wore a jazz bow. That's right. And every Sunday afternoon, he'd take you walking. <laughs> Judy. Yes, Robert? I'm sure having fun walking down the street holding hands. <laughs> well, why don't you hold one of mine? <laughs> You look so nice today. What have you got in your hair? Oh, something new. Hog fat. <laughs> What's new about hog fat? Well, this is today's. <laughs> Come on, let's keep moving. When I stand still, it runs down my collar. <laughs> Robert! <laughs> Robert? Robert, what's that you're chewing on? Candy? Nope, tar. Tar? Robert, throw that tar away. Can't. Been trying to for six days. <laughs> you know, you look nice, too, Judy. I like that dress. Yeah? My, my mother made it for me out of a potato sack. What do you think of it, hmm? <laughs> Should have took out more potatoes. <laughs> At times, like this... <laughs> Got another great line. At times, like this, I'm... Sorry, I'm not a masher. <laughs> the stuff, folks. Right. Well, <laughs> what are we going to do tonight, Robert? Oh, I don't know. Well, let's do something different, something exciting. Okay, let's go down to the swamp and croak at bullfrogs. <laughs> oh, no. Let's go to the drugstore. <laughs> Come on, let's go to the drugstore and get a sody. Oh, sody, sody, sody. That's all you girls want. Come on home and I'll make you sody. I've told you a hundred times, Robert, it can't be done. You can't get bubbles into a glass of water by using a bicycle pump. <laughs> okay, let's go in the drugstore. Let's sit at the counter. Okay. One root beer, four straws. <laughs> Did you say four straws? Yeah, we're supposed to meet another couple here. <laughs> what do you belong to, a share of the burp club? <laughs> Thirst. Oh, keep your shirt on. Robert, did you hear what he said? Yeah, and I think he's right. It's kind of cool in here. <laughs> now, here's your root beer, curly nose. <laughs> Gee, that root beer looks pretty good. Here's your straw, Judy. Come on, I'll race you. Okay, Robert, I'll just... <laughs> I won. <laughs> Robert, I didn't even get one drop in my straw. Well, here, squeeze the drippings out of mine. <laughs> Come on, Judy, let's go home. I'm kind of anxious to get to your house. <laughs> well, all right. Just a minute, lover boy. <laughs> There's such a thing as money, you know. That'll be ten cents. Oh, yeah? Well, here you are. <laughs> There's five. <laughs> Come on, let it drop, brother. Okay, okay. <laughs> Robert, what a sacrifice. You gave him your camper bag. <laughs> well, come on. Let's get out of here. Well, it was nice of you to take me home, Robert. Yeah, here's your house. Mind if I come in for a while? No, I don't mind. Oh, look, there's my old grandfather sitting on the porch. Hello, grandfather. That's, That's all right, Grandpa. Don't bother to get up. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Come on, let's go inside. Come on, Robert, let's sit on the couch. Is it soft? Cry, Robert. Shucks, I don't want to break this egg I got in my pocket. <laughs> well, here we are. Yep. Just look at me cuddle. Gee, I, I sure can cuddle, can't I? Oh, Robert, put your Easter bunny away and pay some attention to me. I want to hold hands. I'll be holding hands every night. I thought of something way better than that. You did? Yep. <coughs> Nobody's around, either. Nope. Come on, let's take off our shoes and hold toes. <laughs> I sure go for you, Judy. Judy? Oh, Judy! Oh, I'm afraid we've awakened Mother. Yes, Mother, what is it? Daughter, have you got that boy Robert down there, or did the same door go open? <laughs> Judy Garland, the Mary Max, Carmen Cavallaro, Bob Hope, Frank Nelson, Paul Win Paula Winslow, the Armed Forces Radio Service Orchestra, and yours truly, Don Wilson. This program is arranged with the cooperation of the Hollywood Victory Committee. Another mail call will be coming your way the next time you hear... This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. <laughs> That's mail call from the 1940s with Judy Garland and an all-star cast for the guys in the service back in the 40s and for uh, all of us now in the 1970s. I'm Chuck Shaden, WNIB, Chicago at FM 97. Our Those Were the Days program this afternoon. A remote, if you will, from the land of Oz as we feature radio programs presenting the stars of The Wizard of Oz. Judy Garland, Ray Bolger, Jack Haley, Bert Lahr, Frank Morgan, and Billy Burke. Not in the roles that they appeared in on the screen, but in uh, various other roles and as themselves on radio, mostly in the 1940s. Well, yeah, Fred, there's a Bert Lahr thing from 1939. The rest are all from the, the 1940s. We'll continue with all of this in just a little bit. We have uh, coming up for the next two weeks, we're going to have uh, consecutive shows for you. We, in other words, what we have are two shows from a series, shows that were heard on the, the first week in the month and the second week in the month, or the third and the fourth, or whatever. Uh, in the next two weeks, we're going to have the first and second show in the entire series of the Danny Kay Show. We've got two consecutive Red Skelton programs, two consecutive Craft Music Hall shows with Al Jolson, one with uh, Jimmy Durante as guest, and the other with uh, Vera Vague as Jolson's guest. We have the first two shows in the series, Stupnagel and Bud, and then we have two Eddie Cantor shows for you. So it's kind of an interesting treatment of these shows. It's just a variety of programs, but we'll have one show in the series next week, and then the following week, another show. Oh, we also have David Carding, Counterspy, uh, 
parts one and two of the Postal Pirates, Blackmail at the Post Office. So we'll have two consecutive uh, counter-spy shows giving you the whole series. Then on the uh, 23rd and the 30th of uh, September, it's Radio for Champions that we share with you. 24 consecutive episodes of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, programs that were broadcast um, mostly during October of 1939. It's the Zamboanga Adventure, and uh, it's an exciting, exciting adventure, and we have all those episodes for you, including uh, then the second week, in addition to Jack Armstrong, when we wrap it up, we'll have uh, Uncle Don reading the funnies and the uh, challenge of the Yukon, Sergeant Preston, and all that sort of stuff. And then as we get into October, we've got a lot of good things, too. We have our annual production of The Jazz Singer, and uh, we're going to have a whole day with Vic and Sade, and um, radio in the 1950s, and at the end of October, our annual Halloween show. So there's a lot of good stuff coming up in the Saturdays ahead of, ahead of you. You can find out exactly when uh, we're programming all of this and what time it's going to be on when you subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. The uh, current issue, the September issue, features a cover picture of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, that's Charles Flynn, and inside you'll find articles from and about the past. A one-year subscription to the newsletter is only $7. You can subscribe right now when you call us at 545-2260. The September reprint articles include an interesting 1945 feature about This Is Your FBI and how the popular radio series dramatizes actual cases from the Bureau's files. There's a story about soap opera pioneer Gertrude Berg and the Goldbergs, and an article about Benny Goodman's opening night at the Palomar Ballroom in Los Angeles in 1935. You'll also find the page of advertisements for television shows popular in Chicago in the 1950s. And Mark Nelson writes about those great B-Westerns produced in Hollywood during the 30s and 40s, and uh, like the ones we're having tonight over at Northwest Federal. You'll also get advanced news about our Saturday night movies at Northwest Federal, plus the complete listing of our Saturday afternoon Those Were the Days programs, giving you lots of information about the vintage shows we schedule here, names of cast members and stars, sponsor identification, uh, a line or two about the content of the show, and even the times of each segment we present in case you're taping shows for your own collection. 545-2260. That's the number to call to subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. A year subscription, 10 issues, is only $7. And if you call now, we'll begin your subscription with the current September issue. We'll send you an invoice with the first issue, which you'll have um, by the end of next week. We'll mail it out on uh, uh, Tuesday morning. 545-2260. If you like... You can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But if it's easier, just give us a call right now, right here at our studio number at 545-2260. Subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide, 545-2260. Northwest Federal Summertime, Summertime. It's Northwest Federal Summertime, Summer Saving Time. Ah, sun, fun, and song. People have lots of ways to spend summertime, and Northwest Federal gives you lots of ways to save. Choose one of 23 gifts free or for special low prices when you deposit $250 or more at any Northwest Federal Savings Center. There's an Igloo ice chest, a Weber grill, a Norelco gotcha hair dryer, a Sunbeam hand mixer, and other gifts to help make summer savings a little easier. So when summer's over, you'll have more than a suntan to show. So sing! It's Northwest Federal Summertime, 63 hours a week, summertime. In the uh, production of The Wizard of Oz by uh, metro Golden mayer back in 1939, Jack Haley uh, portrayed the Tin Man, and it was a memorable performance. Uh, as a matter of fact, as I look um, at the list of cast members from the uh, Wizard of Oz, only Jack Haley and uh, Ray Bolger are still living. Uh, Jack Haley was uh, a bright up-and-coming comedian uh, in the late 1930s, and uh, into the 40s he became very popular. 
uh, radio was a very good uh, place for Jack Haley, and uh, his particular talents were well suited to radio. We're going back now for an excerpt uh, from the, the Philco Radio Hall of Fame from March 26th of 1944. Jack Haley was a guest on the show, guest comedian. He was introduced by Deems Taylor, and uh, they talk about Jack's career and uh, have a little fun with it, too. So let's, uh, for about eight and a half minutes, have some fun as we listen to Jack Haley, who, from the Wizard of Oz, was the Tin Man, is uh, part of our uh, radio salute this afternoon. Ever since a certain young comedian appeared in a yesteryear musical comedy hit called Follow Through, the word has gone around that wherever Jack Haley appears, whether it's a play, a musical, or a picture, you're going to have a good time. Last year, he contributed notably to the nationwide success of the Vaudeville Review, Showtime. This year, I hardly have to remind you that he's been a tremendous hit on the air with Joan Davis. For that long record of achievement, and particularly for his brilliant work with Frank Sinatra in the RKO picture, Higher and Higher, the Radio Hall of Fame flings wide the portals to welcome Jack Haley. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Dean. Uh, you know, Jack, when I saw that picture higher and higher, I thought it peculiar that every time you and Sinatra played a scene together, you were shaking hands. I wasn't shaking hands with Sinatra. Those scenes were played outdoors, and it was a very windy day, and I was just holding him down so he wouldn't blow away. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, if, if memory serves, uh, you were something of a crooner yourself. I remember you introduced Button Up Your Overcoat, and uh, you're an old smoothie in Broadway musicals. Yeah, that's all behind me now, Deans. My soul has responded to the urge that lies deep in the crevices of my throat. Opera. Oh, really, Jack? Yeah. Well, then we have something in common. I dabbled a bit in opera myself. Dabble, eh? Well, I mingled with Mozart, putted with Puccini, and had biscuits with Tortoni. <laughs> I'll never forget the advice I gave Mozart. I said, listen, Mo. Uh, pardon me, Jack. Uh... If you'll pardon my saying so, Mozart died over a hundred years ago. Look, Deems, I don't want to get into any discussion about opera with you. I study with some of the greatest opera stars. Gladys Swartow, Lily Pond, Gypsy Rose Lee. My dear boy, Gypsy Rose Lee doesn't sing. I beg your pardon? Gypsy Rose Lee does not sing. Who cares? <laughs> Well, Jack, you speak like an authority. Uh, in your musical wandering, did you by chance run into an American composer who wrote uh, the operas, uh, well, the King's Henchman and Peter Ibbotson and Ramon Cho? No, I've been too busy composing my own great American opera. It's uh, called You, Me, and a Pretzel. It's, <laughs> it's an old love story with a new twist. <laughs> There's uh, one area that's outstanding. It's called Take Me from the Bronx to Staten Island by the way of Manhattan and Queens. <laughs> you call that an area? You're supposed to say area. I got no joke now. You call that an area? <laughs> He's right. supposed to say area, and then I say Mat Manhattan area. Now I'm dead. I got... I <laughs> have a joke in the first place. That's what I get for being correct. Well, anyway, I intend singing the leading role, Dean. Oh, sort of operatic Orson Welles, mm -hmm. eh? Mm -hmm. My boy, allow me to advise you that the life of an operatic star is a very strenuous one. Constant practice and study. Opera singers get up at six in the morning, take a stroll in the park. Every time they hear a bird, they sing. With me, it's just the opposite. First I sing, and then I hear that... With me, it's just the opposite. <laughs> But I keep my voice in good tri uh, trim, Deems. Twice a day, I'll oil my throat. Tomorrow, I'm going to have the carbon removed. <laughs> I wonder whether you care to hear my opera. Oh, by all means. All right. The first scene opens up in the Pennsylvania Railroad Station, right here in New York City. There are a lot of fellows hanging around there with their old bags. And I hear all... <laughs> and I hear only opera is going down south to see his sweetheart. He walks up to the porter in the station, and he says... <laughs> Boy, is this the Chattanooga suits you? I have my fare and plenty to spare. And as it leaves from track 29, 
spring over your shoebox and give me a dime. Leave the Pennsylvania station a quarter to four. And in a jiffy, we are in the sea <laughs> Nothing could be finer than to walk into the diner. And to have your ham and eggs in Carolina. <laughs> Nothing could be finer. How I'd love to see that saddle and lace. And that push I used to call money by. Get down, Stove Lake. Get down, Stove Lake. Are you absolutely positive the choo-choo with the Chattanooga choo And will it choo-choo me back home to Chattanooga? Now in the next... <laughs> Mr. Paul Whiteman, I would appreciate it very much if you would play my music as is. I played it as is. <laughs> then play it as is. <laughs> now in the next scene, our hero jumps off the train in Chattanooga and he doesn't recognize his sweetheart, but she recognizes him and she rushes up to him and says, Gusto, don't you remember me? Rose O'Day, your filiga, do your cinema, do your balnevar. Then she said she'd like to filiga, do your cinema, do your balnevar. But out of boom to Samonia. But I was very sad, and I said no, and she said please, and I said no, and she said yes, 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 yes. Oh! I'm thinking for a friend of mine, he couldn't get in here tonight, in fact. <laughs> You know, to sing, one must suffer. You, not me! <laughs> now, this next scene, our hero is seated at the head of the table in this large dining hall. All the guests are gathered around. All the guests are eating with gusto. That's our hero's name. And, uh... <laughs> and our heroine, uh, everyone's eating but gusto. So our heroine says, why aren't you eating? And he answers belligerently, Oh, how come all this meat? I know. Potatoes! All this awful meat? I know. Potatoes! Nothing on my plate but meat. There's too much lamb chop, brisket, liver, but no potatoes. Not even candy sweet. Not even Idaho. Not even lionade. Not even one measly little Lou Julian. All this meat and all potatoes. This feels a dust. There's nothing but, but there's everything else. There's bread and butter and salt and hinds of ketchup, but no potatoes. Squash and celery, peas and onions, squash and beans, but no potatoes. No potatoes! Well, there's a side of Jack Haley, you uh, Wizard of Oz fans uh, are surprised to hear, I bet, huh? Interesting, uh, good comedy. We've got uh, Jack coming up later on this afternoon in a, uh, um, a program called The Seal Test Village Store, where he, uh, uh, it's a whole half-hour show with Jack Haley, so if you like Jack, you'll enjoy that, too. Chuck Shaden here on our Those Were the Days program with the uh, remoting, uh, remoting, a remote broadcast from the land of Oz with the radio shows featuring the people who appeared in the Wizard of Oz. We'll be hearing uh, from the wizard himself in just a little bit. Frank Morgan with the Frank Morgan Show. You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Come in and browse for a while. 
you'll find a complete selection of big band, personality, and soundtrack recordings, as well as those great old-time radio shows on cassettes, A-track tape, and LP records. We offer books and magazines about the stars and the days gone by, plus nostalgic jigsaw puzzles, games, cards, gifts, and novelties. An amazing selection of memorabilia, giant one-sheet movie posters, theater lobby cards, photos, magazines, Riverview scenes, lots more at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Shop is open seven days a week, Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Saturday from 10 to 7.30, and every Sunday from noon to 5. Come in, see all the goodies at our good old Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Use your Master Charge or Visa card at Metro Golden Memories. And if you're coming to our memory movie tonight, you want to maybe stop uh, a little earlier and uh, pay a visit to the MGM shop. Uh, we're about 10 blocks west of Northwest Federal Savings. You can stop in. Uh, our place is open till 7.30 tonight. And the movie uh, begins at 8 o'clock. Uh, doors open at 7.30. Our film tonight is a double feature. A couple of good B-Western movies for you. Destry Rides Again from 1932, starring Tom Mix and The Boss of Hangtown Mesa from 1942, starring Johnny Mac Brown with Al Fuzzy Knight. Tickets are a dollar and a quarter a person. Proceeds go to recognized charities. The auditorium at Northwest Federal's Community Center is located in the Northwest Federal Savings Building at 4901 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. Lots of free parking in the lot at the rear of the office on Dakin Street, and you can enter the community center through the parking lot. So we'll be there tonight, and I hope that you'll join us for a good double feature. Uh, they're each about 60 minutes, 61 minutes, 62, 59, I don't know exactly, but they're they're both uh, around an hour. That's how the, the, the pictures were. No time for mushy love stuff and all that other gooey stuff. Just action and excitement, and you're really going to like it. Popcorn, we have popcorn for you, and uh, candy in the refreshment counter. So, I mean, you couldn't possibly go to see a couple of shoot 'em up action-packed westerns like this without munching on popcorn, huh? Wow, that's great stuff. So we'll see you tonight. Doors open 7.30. Uh, film begins at 8 o'clock. You might want to stop at the MGM shop on your way uh, over. Well, we look at um, the sounds of the people who were in The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy uh, was played by Judy Garland, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion, Ray Bolger, Jack Haley, and Bert Lahr. The Wizard of Oz himself was played by Frank Morgan. And in the 1940s, the mid-40s, Frank Morgan had a show on the air called The Fabulous Dr. Tweedy. He's the dean of men at Potts College. Now, there's pretty good, um, pretty good cast of people on this. You'll recognize Gail Gordon here, Janet Waldo, who uh, Janet Waldo was uh, Corliss Archer, and Harry Von Zell is even in this, uh, in this show. Uh, the quality of this recording, which was uh, transcribed from Armed Forces radio discs in the beginning, is uh, not as good as we would like it to be, but after the first five minutes or so, it improves uh, uh, a bit, and I think that you will find it's worth listening to. Frank Morgan, the wizard from The Wizard of Oz, uh, starring in The Fabulous Dr. Tweedy, a broadcast from November 13th of 1946. <laughs> Fabulous Dr. Tweedy, written by Robert Riley Crutcher and starring Frank Morgan. <laughs> Dr. Fabulous Q. Tweedy, Dean of Men at Potts College, and Alexander Potts, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, are very close friends. Whenever there's any trouble, Mr. Potts always knows he can turn to Dr. Tweedy. And Dr. Tweedy never knows which way to turn. Good evening. Oh, good evening, Mr. Potts. It's certainly a pleasure having you call on me. And whatever I've done, I'm sure I can explain it. What have I done? <laughs> Nothing at all. Oh, well, won't you come in then? Thank yes. you, Tweety. I will. Hmm. Ah, Tweety, I haven't been able to sleep nights. I've been terribly worried and upset lately. How is Mrs. Potts? <laughs> Tweety, I've come to spend the night with you. You have? Oh. Yes. You and I have a number of very important administrative problems to discuss. Uh, uh, also, there are your suggested changes in the curriculum to talk over. Oh, the curriculum. I thought it would expedite matters if I spent the night with you. Yes. Why did Mrs. Potts throw you out? 
Well, you see, Tweety, she asked me if her new dress fit into a lot for her figure, and I said, yes, thank goodness, it hides it. I don't see how you had time to pack. Oh, I always keep an emergency suitcase in the car. Well, consider my home a sanctuary. Here you can find Thirsty. I'll carry your bag up to the guest room. Uh, I'll carry it, sweetie. What? I have a fifth of very expensive mouthwash in there. <laughs> yes, well, I don't know what condition the room is in. Nicodemus left me last week. His brother got a job, and Nicodemus didn't see any point in both of them working. Here you are, Miss Fox. Ah, delightful room, sweetie. <laughs> Isn't it? Yes, it looks so, uh... Yes. So, uh... <laughs> uh lived in. <laughs> Yes, well, you see, my dog, Baldy's been sleeping in here. Get down off the bed, Baldy. Oh, my, he's scratching again. <laughs> More fleas. Yes, one bit him. Uh, I'd better take these old soup bones off your bed, Miss Spot. <laughs> there are enough here to put the cow back together again. <laughs> Yes, here's a delightful room. Oh, you'll feel right at home here, Miss Potts. <laughs> You're in the doghouse. <laughs> hey, well, let me unpack. <laughs> uh, 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 be careful, Tweety. Mm, I never heard of this mouthwash before. Old Backwoods Phil. <laughs> Where shall I put it, Miss Potts? In the chandelier or hang it out the window? <laughs> Give me that bottle. Yeah, watch out, Miss Spot. Well, a... oh. oh, no. Well, don't worry, Miss Spots. I have a bottle of Listerine you can have. <laughs> Here, let me put your shirts in the dresser. <laughs> this always happens in damp weather. My drawers get warm. <laughs> Every time I try to get into them, they squeak. <laughs> So this is where I hid that last batch of biscuits Miss Kitty Bell brought me. I have to keep them away from Baldy. He'll break his teeth. <laughs> there, that takes care of the shirts. <laughs> now let's open a window and air out the room. Great Scott, sweetie. What's that horrible noise? Well, that's Miss Kitty Bell next door. She's singing. She has a sort of coloratura peanut whistle. <laughs> How do you stand it? Oh, it doesn't bother me. I put on my earmuffs. Do you have another pair? <laughs> She's in fine voice tonight. <laughs> I wonder what opera that's from. Aida? <laughs> Carmen? <laughs> I've got... Mr. Potts, she's screaming for help. Come on. <laughs> The door's open. Oh, 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 Dr. Tweedy, save me, save me. Miss Kitty Bell, let go. Your arms, you're choking oh, me. Oh, Dr. Tweedy, save me, save me. Come on, Miss Potts, save me, save me. <laughs> oh, Dr. Tweedy, I'm so scared. Uh, I'm all alone this evening. Yeah. My brother Beauregard went over to the chemistry building. Yeah. He went right over after supper to get some experiments. But, yeah. but, Miss Kitty Bell, why did you scream? Oh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, there I was, standing in the kitchen with the door open, and I declare in walked a man, a strange man. I got so excited, all I could do was scream. He turned around and ran right out of the house. Yeah, I'd have done the same thing. <laughs> I'll report this to Sheriff Putter. We can't have any prowlers around the campus. Excuse me, I'll use your phone. Oh, I couldn't spend the rest of the evening here all alone. You just got to stay with me, Dr. Treaty. I oh, need somebody to hold my hand. We oh, can yeah. sit on the sofa and talk. Oh, with yeah. you real close to me, I'd feel so safe. <laughs> yeah, you would. Well, I wouldn't. I'll, uh, I'll go out and beat around the bushes if there's a power. <laughs> If there's a prowler, I'll find it. Oh, but who's going to stay here with poor little me? Uh, uh, Mr. Potts will. Oh. I'll go outside and take a look around. Oh, but Dr. Tweedy. Dr. Tweedy, is that you? Yes, Mary, what is it? Your phone's ringing. Oh, it is? Mary and I want to see you, Dr. Tweedy. Well, come on in. Wait for me in the study. Hello? 
Yes, this is Dr. Tweedy. Oh, hello, Mrs. Potts. You want to speak to your husband? Well, Mr. Potts is out. <laughs> no, 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 no. He stepped out. <laughs> Where? He's with Miss Kitty Bell Jackson. No, Miss Kitty Bell Jackson. She wanted someone to sit on the sofa with her and hold her hand. <laughs> you see why? Well, a few minutes ago, she was running around the house screaming for help, but everything's quiet now. <laughs> the only reason he's over there is because her brother is working tonight. He's experimenting. <laughs> no, not Mr. Potts. <laughs> her brother. Mrs. Potts, such language. You're leaving now? You're coming over here? Oh, no, but Mrs. Potts, you better... That's never, you've got, she hung up. <laughs> I wonder why she always thinks the worst of Mr. Potts. Come on in the study, Dr. Tweedy, and see what we've got. Oh, yes. What, uh, what do you have in that box, Sidney? Look, Dr. Tweedy. <laughs> well, a gopher. <laughs> a beautiful specimen of Thomas Talapadoys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because our football team's called the Potts Gophers. Oh. And remember our motto, get in there and dig. Yeah. Well, Sydney got the team a trained gopher for a mascot. Yeah, we named him Filbert. Filbert, shake hands with Dr. Tweedy. Uh, oh, he stands up on his hind legs. Shake hands, Filbert. <laughs> Ow, he bit me. <laughs> Silbert. <laughs> Silbert, you're a bad gopher. Oh, now look, isn't that cute? He's sorry. He's licking the wound. Ow! With those teeth, he could eat Miss Kitty Bell's biscuits. <laughs> the football team says he's good luck. They have to rub his fur before they can play. Yeah, we're playing Bullfinch University tomorrow, and some of their kids are trying to kidnap Silbert, so we'll lose the game. Good luck rubbing a gopher? Rubbish. Oh, it's true, Dr. Tweedy. Krausmeyer, our quarterback, rubbed his fur, and he completed five 60-yard passes in a row. He did? Really? Well, now, is that so? I uh, had a phone call a moment ago, and, well, I could use some luck. Here, Philbert, let me rub your fur. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> Look, Dr. Tweedy, I made him a little football uniform, just like the team wears. Oh. Here, I'll put it on him. See? The school colors. Yes. A green football helmet. Oh. Uh, hold still, Filbert. A yellow jersey. Oh. No, no, hold up both arms. <laughs> and a little purple moleskin pants with a hole for the tail. I'll pull it through. Ow! <laughs> if we could leave him with you overnight, Dr. Tweedy, we know he'd be safe. Well... Well, guard him with your life, Dr. Tweedy. But you... We'll let you put him in his cage. But you... Hey, good night, Dr. Tweedy. Good night. But you don't... Uh, I don't... I, oh, well... Come here, Philbert. Come here. Come back here. Filbert! 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 Yeah. There, I've caught you. Tired, aren't you? <laughs> well, so am I. Now, into your cage. <clears throat> Oh, dear. I'll get the mop from the broom closet. Uh... Hiya, Doc. Help! Not so loud, Doc. It's me, Welby. Welby! Yeah. Welby Skinkle! <laughs> when did you get back? What are you doing here? I'm hiding in the broom closet. Well, this is a surprise. Welcome home, Welby. Oh, gee, Doc, it's your great to hear you say that. Well, All the time I was riding the freights, I could hear you saying, Welcome home, Welby, yeah. you bum. <laughs> oh, Welby, how I've missed you. No. I've dreamed about those heavenly stews you used to cook for me. Yeah, 
Slum Gullion. Slum Gullion. <laughs> well, B, how long have you been hiding in the closet to surprise me? Since that tomato next door screamed for help. Uh, tomato? You were the prowler. Me? Yes. A prowler? Yes. Now, Doc, listen, I'm a respectable bum. I got in the house next door by mistake. I was in a big hurry to see you. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, the cops was after me. Well, you know, the police? What for? What'd you do? I came to town. <laughs> well, you'll not be persecuted while you're under the protection of Dr. Thaddeus Q. Tweedy. No, oh, you're a sweet guy, Doc. You know something? No, for one horrible minute, I thought you was married. Well, B, that's too horrible. <laughs> but listen, Doc, what if that tomato remembers what I look like? She'll accuse me of busting into her house. Well, now, don't you worry about Miss Kitty Bell. She'll never recognize you. We'll wash your face. <laughs> okay. But listen, that ain't the worst of it, Doc. I left my fingerprints all over her doorknob. Impossible. You're wearing black gloves. Doc. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, there's the sink and some soap. Wash off your gloves. <clears throat> I give you my word, Welby, the police will never discover that you were the prowler. I'll go right over and wipe the fingerprints off Miss Kitty Bell's door now myself. Uh, no, but, Doc... Uh, when I'm through, they won't blame you for this. Uh, but, Doc, the cops are staked out over there. They'll nab you. And they'll throw you in the clink. The fabulous Dr. Tweedy, starring the fabulous Frank Morgan there, uh, of earlier Wizard of Oz fame, in which he starred as the wizard. In the, he didn't really star. He appeared as the wizard in The Wizard of Oz. I would call him a star. Every person in that uh, film was a star, I suspect. This is Chuck Shaden. Uh, those were the day's program, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. We got a couple of phone calls from people saying... Uh, you were wrong. There is still another survivor of the cast of The Wizard of Oz, uh, mentioning Margaret Hamilton, who was the Wicked Witch of the West. She is still living. Yes, she's doing some commercials and she's doing some other things. Um, she is not in our collection of radio broadcasts today, uh, primarily because I couldn't find any radio shows uh, where I could identify Margaret Hamilton. But she is, along with Jack Haley and Ray Bolger, uh, the surviving principles from uh, uh, the Wizard of Oz. So to set the record straight, thank you for uh, calling and giving us some info on, uh, on that, folks who did call. The in footwear for young men and women this season is Welco High Pals hiking boots, and for good reason. They're snug, warm, and durable, besides being fashionable. Your headquarters for Welco High Pals hiking boots is the Paul Meyer Shoe Store at 2924 Central Street in Evanston. The Paul Meyer Shoe Store has them in all sizes, and remember that Welco High Pals hiking boots have vulcanized construction to ensure flexibility. For hiking boots, it's Welco High Pals, and for Welco, it's the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street, Evanston. Here's a list of helpful hints that should aid you in determining when your rugs and carpets are soiled, and it's time to call Magicist. When geranium starts sprouting in the dining room shag, it's time to call Magicist. When there's a slight layer of dust on everything and your sugar is off-white, it's time to call Magicist. When the dog lies down on the living room carpet and sets off a raging dust storm, it's time to call Magicist. When your carpet contains so much soil the government pays you not to grow any crops, it's time to call Magicist. Now, none of these signs may be present and your rugs and carpets may be less than clean. So call Magicist for pickup and delivery of rugs and draperies or for in-home or in-office cleaning of carpeting and furniture. For a free quotation, Chicago phones 378-8600. Suburbs, see your phone book. Advertising managers, media buyers, account execs, <laughs> Dick McCullough, ask Magicist about their spectacular signs, special rates for nonprofit organizations. Call Magicist today for details. Uh, crafty remark. Now let's get back to the fabulous Dr. Tweedy. And now back to Frank Morgan as the fabulous Dr. Tweedy. Dr. Tweedy promised to wipe Welby's fingerprints off Miss Kitty Bell's doorknob. 
We join Sheriff Putters as he takes Dr. Tweedy's fingerprints in the Potsfield Jail. Now, how do I get this ink off my fingers? The same way you got those fingerprints off the doorknob. Wipe. <laughs> Tweedy, you just compounded a felony. You know what that means? What does it mean? Uh, who cares? <laughs> Caught you red-handed. Good thing I was out there with my posse. You're a, you're a prowler. How could a brilliant man like you sink so low? Oh, well, I... Why, you must be losing your mind, Dr. Tweedy. Yes, I got it. I can only think of one excuse. What is it? Temporary insanity. Uh, one excuse. Uh, temporary insanity. I, uh... Oh, uh... Don't you look at me like that. Well, stand back, Dr. Tweedy. Stand back. I was thinking this, this case was a hard nut to crack. Be quiet, Uncle. Yeah, but I cracked it. You're cracked. Now, c- come in the fitting room with me, Dr. Tweedy. I want you to try on a new sport coat. Ties in the back. <laughs> Canvas. Yes, sir. Oh, and you be crazy about it. No, 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 no. Now, that won't be necessary. The attack is over now. I'm all right. It's just that I have those blank periods occasionally. I can't remember anything that happens. Mm-hmm. You know, you've been working too hard, Dr. That's Tweedy. It. Yeah, that's it. Thinking too much. Yes, thinking. What a pathetic spectacle when a great mind cracks up. Oh, Sheriff, you have a remarkable depth of understanding. Yes, you you better go home and lie down, Dr. Tweedy. Yes, I think I will. Uh... And the next time you feel one of these attacks coming on, if you, if you see things that ain't there, rush down here and I'll lock you up for your own good. I know you'll be kind, Sheriff Butters. You can always count on me in a pinch. I've... Oh, no. <laughs> Welby, we're glad you're back. Dr. Tweedy needs someone like you to look after him. Yeah, I'm whipping up some stool for him now. You know, I cut off my right arm up to here for Doc. We came back to get Filbert, the gopher. Yeah. There was a prowler around tonight, and we can't take a chance on those Bullfinch University kids swiping him. Pop's college would lose the football game tomorrow if that gopher disappeared. Yeah. What does he play, halfback? <laughs> no, mascot. I'd better carry him in my pocket. Then if those kids are spying, they won't know we have him. We we found a safer place to hide him. Yeah, okay, here he is. Come on, Filbert. You're going to ride in a caboose like a papoose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks, Welby. Come on, Sidney, let's go. T for two and two for T. I like Doc and he likes me. Welby! Uh, Welby! Hmm. I can tell you're home again by the smell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't. I mean, I can smell the stew you're it's making. Oh, yes. <laughs> Slumgullion. Oh, sure. The aroma permeates the atmosphere. It, well, maybe it does, but it'll taste good. <laughs> Here you are, Doc. A big bowl full. Oh, that's delicious. Yes. Fit for a king. And you are a king, too, Doc. I tell everybody that. Yeah. Every desk sergeant in the country knows about you. Oh, no. I personally have wrote your name on the wall of every cell. Every cell. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> you can forget about your little problem with the sheriff. I have considerable influence in this town. Yes, yeah, Doc. I, I saw all those cops grab you at the doorknob. Yes, well, the incident is closed. Well, gee, thanks, Doc. I'm infinitely grateful to you. As the Romans said in hoc signo winkes. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know something, Doc? You got a beautiful skull. Yeah, this smuggullion is good. <laughs> the meat is so tasty. <laughs> What is it? The meat? Well, I don't exactly know, Doc. Yeah. It wasn't the squirrel, and it wasn't the chipmunk. Well, when, when I caught it, it bit me. <laughs> Welby, that cage, Filbert, is gone. Yeah, Doc, he's gone. Oh. Fat little guy, wasn't he? Oh. <laughs> 
let me see. What was that? It wasn't a squirrel and it wasn't a chipmunk. Oh, well, they, how could you? Mm -hmm. Poor little Filbert. He was so cute. The way he'd sit up on his hind legs, look at me with his little brown eyes, take hold of my finger, and bite it to the bone. <laughs> Poor little Filbert. Yeah. Well, have some more slum gullion, Doc. How can I face all those students and tell them that I ate their gopher? Huh? I feel like a cannibal. Oh, no, Doc, it wasn't a gopher. I remember now, it was a rabbit. Rabbit? A rabbit then yeah. where's Philbert? Why isn't he in his cage? Well, a couple of kids come and took him away. Oh, no. Philbert's been kidnapped. Huh? We'll lose the football game. I've got to go and find Philbert. Yeah, no, but, Doc. <laughs> Sheriff! Sheriff Butters! Oh, hello, Dr. Tweedy. You feeling better now? Oh, I feel fine, but I want to report a kidnapping. A kidnapping? Yes, Philbert's been kidnapped. Oh, that's a federal offense. Have to call in the FBI and make yeah. a report. Yeah. Uh, what, what's his full name? Well, what's the difference? He's a thumb of us. How pop the boy it is. Oh, 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 one of them they're foreigners, huh? <laughs> is, he, is he subversive? Well, he works underground. Mm. Uh, nearest relatives? Uh, well, his cousin is a squirrel. You mean he's nuts? No, no. <laughs> he collects nuts. Filbert's a nut. No, no, no. Filbert's a gopher. Oh, Oh, a gopher's been uh, kidnapped. Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, yes, now I get it. Sure, Dr. Tweedy, come on and tell me all about it. Can you describe him? Well, when I last saw him, he was wearing a little yellow football jersey. <laughs> well, that's natural. But is there anything unusual about him? No. <laughs> He was wearing a little green football helmet. Mm -hmm. Green, huh? Yeah. Probably plays for Notre Dame. <laughs> and he was wearing purple moleskin pants. Oh, it sounds like uh, quite a dude. Uh, with a hole in the back for his tail. Oh, yes, yes. I've seen those in Esquire. <laughs> was he wearing shoes? Shoes? Now, let me think. No, he was barefoot. Mm -hmm. Here, Billy Gopher. <laughs> well, now, come with me, Dr. Tweedy. I have a nice surprise for you in the back room. You have? Mm -hmm. Oh, you found Silver. That's wonderful. Yes, you step right in here, Doctor. <laughs> well, I don't see him. <clears throat> Sheriff, let me out of this cell. I'm doing this for your own good, Dr. Tweedy. But, Sheriff Butters, I'm all right. Come back here. <laughs> He's all right, I'm Queen of the May. What a pitiful sight. A great mind has cracked. His precox is demented. <laughs> Sheriff Potter, will you take care of Filbert for us tonight? This is the safest place we could think of to hide him. Uh, here he is. Oh, a gopher. With a green football helmet. Yellow jersey. Purple moleskin pants. Tail sticking out of the hole. <laughs> and barefooted. Oh, excuse me, please. Oh, oh, help. Come out, Dr. Sweetie, come out. Well, thank you. I knew you'd see your mistake. Let me uh, in there. Yeah? You were only looking for that gopher, but I've seen him. <laughs> It's certainly nice of you to stay here and protect me, Mr. Park. Well, Are you fun. sure I can't fix you something to eat? No, thanks. How about some southern fried chicken? Right. I have six legs. They don't show. <laughs> oh, maybe some of my corn. <laughs> Perhaps some of my southern yams fried in the lane. No, my ulcers are... Oh, excuse me. That's the doorbell. <laughs> Well, Dr. Tweedy, it says it took you long enough to hunt for that prowler. Well, Mary called me, and I had to run over and answer the phone. And then I went down to the... Oh, well, uh, where's Mr. Potts? I have an urgent message for him. Uh, what is it, Tweedy? Mrs. Potts called, and I That's told... That's enough, Tweedy. What? Let's get out of here. Oh, you are. Don't move a 
muscles. Uh, 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 yes, my dear. Hello, Mrs. Potts. Have you met Miss Kitty Bell Jackson? Uh, how do you do? Uh, Miss Kitty Bell, would you mind making us a pot of tea and bring us some of your delicious chewy molasses cookies? Oh, I'd love to. What are you doing here with that woman? You worn out wolf. <laughs> Buttercup, I was not... Buttercup! <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Potts, I'd give anything to have a woman love me as you love Mr. Potts. <laughs> we, you must be losing your mind. There be none of beauty's daughters with a magic like thee. And like music on the waters is thy sweet voice to me. Oh. Lord Byron. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Swift. <laughs> <laughs> the things you say to a girl. <laughs> girl. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Potts, your face is like... No! Yes. This time, I'm not going to let you talk me out of it. Well, well, here's the cookies. Now, I'll go get the cheese. Just in time. Mrs. Potts, have one of Miss Kitty Bell's chewy molasses cookies. Here, I'll put it in your mouth. Oh, thank you. Alexander, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. <laughs> oh, my, my, that's too bad. Her teeth are caught in the cookie and her mouth is stuck shut. Miss <laughs> Potts, you better take her home. And here's a few extra cookies. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tweety. Come along, dear. And a good night. Oh, here's the tea. Oh, uh, teapot. Oh. <laughs> I was all set to sit down and have a nice long chat with him, but to tell you the truth, I'm awfully glad they're gone. <laughs> well, I'd I'm... much rather sit here on the sofa and have a long, long talk with you. <laughs> long, long talk. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Uh, Miss Kitty Bell, have one of your delicious chewy molasses cookies. Oh, well, I, I never eat my own cooking. I always give it away. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> oh, come on and have a cookie. I'll put it in your mouth. Oh, well, that's different. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. oh Dr. Tweedy, sometimes I think you're the most... Good night, Miss Kitty Bell. Morgan with his thought for the week. My topic for today is fair play. Do unto others as they may do unto you, but don't let them catch you at it. <laughs> Which brings me to my thought for the week. Never hit a fellow when he's down. He may get up and beat the stuffings out of you. Good night. <laughs> this is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. The fabulous Dr. Tweedy, a Frank Morgan show there from November 13th of 1946 by way of Armed Forces Radio, uh, starring uh, the man who played the wizard in The Wizard of Oz. And we're uh, playing a lot of uh, things this afternoon with uh, performers who appeared in The Wizard of Oz, that great 1939 film classic. Yet to hear from uh, our Ray Bolger, uh, Billy Burke, Bert Lahr, and again, we'll hear from uh, Jack Haley and uh, Judy Garland as we uh, 
continue um, our program this afternoon on WNIB, Chicago FM 97. This is Chuck Shaden, and this is a brand new month, so we have a brand new cassette tape of the month to share with you. I want you to listen to this uh, uh, beginning of one of two adventures of Sherlock Holmes. You know, uh, I'm particularly excited about hearing your story tonight. Last week you told us that Sherlock Holmes' brother, Mycroft Holmes, took part in the adventure. That's quite right, Mr. Bartell. I didn't even know Mr. Holmes had a brother. I wish you'd tell me something about him. Well, Mycroft was seven years older than Sherlock, but the difference between them was amazing. While Holmes was lean and consumed with a burning energy, his elder brother was fat and lazy. And yet Holmes has often told me that Mycroft was his superior in powers of observation and deduction. Well, now that you've thoroughly whetted my appetite, Doctor, how's about it? Very well, my boy. Now, I suppose this story really began in Mycroft Holmes' room at the Foreign Office in London. Though I've said that he was, a, he was a lazy man, he did hold a position of considerable importance. In fact, you may remember that on more than one occasion, Holmes has said Mycroft is the British government to get back to my story. So on a June morning in 1912, just before the First World War, that a young man in the foreign office named Guy Travers stood talking to Mycroft Holmes, who sat sprawled in an armchair before him, his feet resting on another chair, his cupped hands cradling his ample stomach. Oh, what a story is about to be told there by Dr. Watson on this... Uh... 1945 radio adventure of Sherlock Holmes. It's very difficult to find uh, Sherlock Holmes stories from radio starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. And those that have uh, been uncovered have not been what I would consider superior sound quality. This that we offer on our cassette tape for September is the best sound quality that we've found yet uh, of these Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce stories. So you have not one but two great Sherlock Holmes adventures uh, this month on our cassette tape for September. Rathbone and Bruce star in a pair of 1945 Petri Wine broadcasts on Mutual. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, two of the best, back-to-back -back on a single cassette tape, only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. You'll have a great adventure with Holmes and Watson in A Scandal in Bohemia. A king is about to be married, but he's being blackmailed by an adventurer he met years ago. Plus, The Great Gandolfo, involving uh, the king of magicians, his twin assistants, and murder. A brand new cassette tape for your good old collection. A Sherlock Holmes doubleheader, $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. If you like, you can get your tape at any of the six offices of Northwest Federal Savings or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce star in two rare radio adventures of Sherlock Holmes, our cassette tape of the month for September, $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Now, as we continue with our look at the uh, radio talents of the stars of the Wizard of Oz, we turn to um, the Scarecrow, Ray Bolger. We go back to 1944 for this uh, series of excerpts from the Philco Radio Hall of Fame, November 26th of 44. We have three excerpts uh, for you. The first is uh, just under four minutes, and um, uh, Ray Bolger is the guest master of ceremonies on the program. And uh, in this first little bit, he talks about uh, radio programming, which might be of interest to us. So let's tune in to Ray Bolger back in 1944. Your guest master of ceremonies is not only one of the foremost dancers of the day, but is an accomplished comedian in pantomime and the spoken word, all of which he has proven in his film role of the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz and in the sparkling part he performed in Stage Door Canteen, as well as in the musical comedy hit by Jupiter, which ran over a year on Broadway. He is especially dear to your hearts because he was in the first USO unit ever to entertain our troops offshore, and because he has just returned from a five-month stint of performing for our men in the Pacific, Ray Bolger. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you, and how do you do, ladies and gentlemen? It's a pleasure appearing on this program with such artists as Hildegard, who is here with two songs, Elizabeth Bergner, who is here with the two Mrs. Carrolls, and Paul Whiteman, who is here with two stomachs. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here. Too bad. Well, what do you want, Sinatra? <laughs> oh, dear. Everything seems to have changed since I got back from overseas. There's even a new recruiting slogan for sailors. Join the Navy and see Eleanor. <laughs> and that's not all. Thanksgiving Day, I was walking past the meat market on Broadway. The butcher had his cleaver raised over a turkey, and just as he was about to swing, the turkey looked up at him and said, Please don't do it. I haven't seen Oklahoma yet. <laughs> but the greatest changes are in radio. Ah, those radio commercials. They're beauty. Does your cigarette taste different lately? They do. Well, where are you getting them? <laughs> Presenting young Dr. Malone. Nurse. Hand me the scalpel. Dutcher. Chloroform. Scalpel. Needle. Now tell me, where's the patient? <laughs> and the next program an announcer says, guaranteed, not for years, not for life, but forever. Then President Roosevelt comes on for a fireside chat. <laughs> But my favorite is a certain daytime serial. When last we saw Mrs. Higginbottom, she was knitting a sweater for her little one. The needle slipped, stabbed her in the back. She falls into the baby's crib, knocks the kid unconscious. A scream wakes her father, who falls out of bed and breaks a bottle of Johnny Walker. His wife steps out, cuts herself on the broken glass. And in the middle of this gory mess, the announcer comes to the microphone and says, Isn't life wonderful? <laughs> and there's that quiz character. Next question comes from the balcony. Up in the balcony, Mr. Underdunk in the balcony. I have a lady doctor. You have a lady doctor? No, I have a lady doctor. Oh, this next question is worth 247,000 green stamps. What type of dancing was prominent in the year 1926? You're right. What did you say? Oh, the Charleston. That is correct. Give that lady one box of fudgy. Twelve delicious fudgy. Chocolate covered to keep their insides warm. <laughs> and what do they have inside? Nuts. <laughs> now try one of these fudgies today. First, remove one from the box. Now, remove the wrapper. Now, open your mouth. Now, place the fudgy into your mouth. Now, bite into it. Now, try and open your mouth. <laughs> A little stand-up comedian there, uh, Ray, uh, a little of a stand-up comedian's uh, routine, Ray Bolger, back on November 26th of 1944, a clip from the Radio Hall of Fame program. We'll have another uh, little bit from that show in just uh, a little bit here on WNIB. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where you can shop with confidence for all the family. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womet. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Quality plus value seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmet. You're tuned to the 97 spot on your FM dial, WNIB. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program. You join us every Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 for all the good old sounds from uh, the good old days. And today we're saluting the stars of The Wizard of Oz, the movie uh, from MGM back in 1939. And we're into uh, Ray Bolger now as we join uh, Ray as uh, uh, the host of the uh, Philco Radio Hall of Fame from 1944. And uh, his guest on this segment is, uh, is Hildegard, the singer. Let's listen. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now present a problem in radio mathematics? Glamour plus an international reputation plus a superb individuality equals radio's most unique starring personality. Your approval has made her Raleigh Cigarette Program one of the ten most popular shows on the air. She certainly deserves her niche in your Philco Hall of Fame. She should really have two niches, one in your microphone room devoted to your radio favorites and the other in your cafe corner because she is the highest paid cafe star in the world. 
the girl who took Milwaukee out of the beer category into the cafe, Hildegard. <laughs> Hildegard, really, I'm looking forward to hearing you play the piano today on the Radio Hall of Fame. Oh, thank you, Ray. But do you mind if I make a suggestion? No, go ahead. I have a much greater talent. I tell incomparable jokes, and I think they ought to be in the Hall of Fame, too. Jokes? Yes. <laughs> Here's one of them. Tell me, why is a hessian in delicate health like a place where you buy cold meat and pickles? I don't know. Why is a hessian in delicate health like a place where you buy cold meat and pickles? Because it's a delicate hessian. <laughs> how did my drummer get here? Ray, but how did you like it? I'm looking forward to hearing you play the piano. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Well, here's another one. I, I, I really think this should be on the Hall of Fame, too, and it's so funny, Ray. The piano is over there. Well, anyway, here it is. Do you know why some of the new long dresses are called sausage dresses? No. Because they're bologna. Get it? <laughs> Get it? Sausage, bologna, bologna. Yeah. Uh, Does your sm joke smell different lately? <laughs> Are you finished telling jokes? <laughs> oh, because if you're not finished uh, telling jokes, the piano is yes. still there. Well, don't worry. When I'm finished telling jokes, the piano will still be here. Yeah, but will this audience? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think so. It's, it's so cold outside. Well, anyway, here's another joke. I think it's simply wonderful. It's a riddle. Why do firemen wear red suspenders? To keep their pants up. Uh, that just shows you how a new joke gets around. <laughs> God, will you please go to the piano? Oh, all right, Ray. I'll go quietly. Hildegard is now approaching the piano gracefully. She's at the piano now. And now... I am sitting. I'm sitting at the piano, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to play and sing a song which I first heard when I entertained in a cafe in Paris some years ago. The composer of the song, Jean Blanc, worked in the same cafe and he taught it to me. It's based on a simple musical scale. Harold Rome recently wrote a lovely English lyric, and it is called, All of a Sudden My Heart Sings. All of a sudden my heart sings When I remember little things The way you dance and hold me tight The way you kiss and say good night. The crazy things we say and do, the fun it is to be with you. Remembering all those little things, all of a sudden, my heart sings. The secret way you press my hand, to let me know you understand the wind and rain upon your face, the breathless world of your embrace, your little laugh and half surprise, the starlight gleaming in your eyes. The magic thrill that's in your touch. Oh, darling, I love you so much. The secret way you press my hand to show me that you understand the wind and rain upon your face. The breathless world of your embrace, your little laugh and half surprise, the starlight gleaming in your eyes, remembering all those little things, all of a sudden, my heart.
That was Hildegard, uh, introduced by Ray Bolger. A lot of, a lot of fun there as Ray uh, uh, made a little fluff there on uh, this Radio Hall of Fame broadcast for Philco back on November 26th of 1944. There's some more fun ahead with uh, uh, Ray Bolger and uh, uh, Hildegard uh, in another segment that runs about nine and a half minutes, which we'll have for you in just about one minute. If you haven't had a chance to see the new Betamax videotape recorder by Sony, why don't you go over to Townhouse TV and Appliances for a complete demonstration of an exciting way to watch television. Uh, now, you know, the Betamax videotape recorder lets you watch one show while you're recording another to watch whenever you want. And with the Sony automatic timer, you can even record a favorite program or a special while you're away from the set. The new uh, Betamax system now is a built-in timer. It's a machine that goes for two hours automatically, and with the new tape that's coming out, you'll be able to get three hours on it. It's a super uh, piece of uh, entertainment equipment for you. It's the all-new Betamax video recording system by Sony. See it at Townhouse TV and Appliances, 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. They will be pleased to demonstrate the Sony videotape recorder for you. Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Townhouse TV and Appliances. From the Wizard of Oz to radio in 1944, here's more of Ray Bolger. Oh, Hildegard. Oh, yes, Ray, I'm here. I'm coming. Uh, yes, Ray. <laughs> I'm glad to see you. You know, I might have kidded you about the gags before, but I want you to know it's a distinct privilege to have such a charming and gracious lady amongst us, ain't it? <laughs> you flatter me. <laughs> but I am grateful for your tribute, Ray. Oh, that's all right. I've always gotten a thrill out of you. Oh, Ray, you overpower me. That might be fun, too. <laughs> but, Hildegard, I've watched you perform in those swanky Park Avenue cafes, the Persian Room and the Raleigh Room, and you're wonderful. Oh, thank you. Ah, dear. You flit from table to table, chatting with your distinguished guests, and yet... You always retain that air of reserve of someone far away, unreachable, unattainable, like a waiter at Lindy's. <laughs> but, Ray, if you enjoy mingling with a social set, I must invite you to my next tea. Tea? How jolly. Shall I bring my own bag? <laughs> any, any friend of yours is a friend of mine. <laughs> oh, dear, I'll ignore that. Simply because you sing so romantical. What was that again? I said I'll ignore that simply because you sing so romantical. Romantical? Yes. Uh, do I really? Uh -huh. I remember the last time I heard you. I was having alphabet soup. When you began singing, every letter I in that plate blew its top. Oh, you're much too kind. No. I think you're the most romantic singer I ever heard. Why, when you sing the last time I saw Paris... I can almost see the postcards in your eyes. <laughs> How about singing one of those intimate songs for us now? All right, Ray, I'll be delighted to. I will sing a song which is intimate in a way because it is, it is in the thoughts of every one of us. The song is called When the Boys Come Home, and I know we all hope that that will be very, very soon. <laughs> When the boys come home, the clouds will trip lightly away, away, the clouds will trip lightly away. When the boys come home, we'll all be as merry as May, as May, we'll all be as merry as May. There'll be drums and trumpets, tea and trumpets, out on the village green. A silvery moon for that reunion scene. Oh, what joy when the boys come home. The clouds will trip lightly away, away. The clouds will trip lightly away. There'll be drums and trumpets, tea and trumpets, out on the village green, a silvery moon for that reunion scene. Oh, what joy when the boys come home. The glorious sound of the tramping feet will echo down the wide.
winding street that leads to a lane where lovers meet. And may it prove so sweet, so sweet, that they will never more roam. Yes, why? Well, I... Yes. <laughs> Say, wasn't that play with Elizabeth Bergen at the two Mrs. Carrolls exciting? Oh, you bet. It had me right on the edge of my seat all through it. That's giving it quite an edge. <laughs> <laughs> but what got me was the way poor Mrs. Carroll had to live in the same house with a murderer. That's not so tough. Oh, yeah. Suppose you were married to a woman who was going to kill you. It's only a question of time with any of them. <laughs> Paul. Paul, I... listen. I've got an idea. Let's make believe we're both married to the same woman, a murderess. At present, I live with her in a bleak English house on the moors. Presenting now, the two Mr. Hildegards. <laughs> Are you Raymond Hildegard? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Who are you? I'm Paul, the very first Mr. Hildegard. Really, now, from here you look like the first three. <laughs> oh, boy, don't you believe that I'm the first Mr. Hildegard? Oh, by Jove, yes. Ah, uh, now I remember. <laughs> the missus even told me about your honeymoon. Please, please, sir, let's not be crude. What a honeymoon. You had twin beds just for yourself. <laughs> oh, very amusing. I've come in on a most serious mission. Your wife is trying to poison you, old boy. As she did me. Oh, come now. Cough if you like. But she put small do doses of poison in the milk. <laughs> then every day for 12 years, she made me drink milk. Finally got you looking like the cow, didn't she? <laughs> and now, now she's trying to poison me. Yes, so what? Oh. oh, darling. Oh, dear. She mustn't see me. I'll hide here behind this couch. Oh, what are you staring? What are you staring at? Don't look now, but your hip is showing. <laughs> well, put a vase on it, old boy. <laughs> Don't forget, don't drink the milk. Let me in, darling. Uh, Let me in your bed. Why don't these things ever happen to me in real life? <laughs> I'm sorry, dear, but I refuse to let you in the room. You won't open the door? No. <laughs> Welcome to Inner Sanctum. <laughs> Hello, Raymond, old thing. Give me a kiss. No. Oh, you are getting to be an old thing. But, darling, guess what? I have some milk for you. I don't want any milk. <laughs> But Raymond, dearest, you're so thin. You're so very thin. Am I really thin? Yes, of course. Why do you think I wear these bobby socks around the house? <laughs> Come now, drink this milk. All right. Uh, 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 uh. What's that? Heartburn. <laughs> You look so pale, Raymond. Are you afraid of me? No. No. What makes you think I'm afraid? You've seen me bite my nails before. Yes, but never the ones on your feet. <laughs> well, things have been mighty suspicious around here. For instance, what did you do with all the money I had? I hid it. Where? Right here in my stocking. Oh, yes. 
Two of the nicest safety vaults in the kingdom. Oh, you are a dear. Here, have some milk. All right. Uh, 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 uh. What was that? Still the same old fat hot burn. <laughs> Raymond, Raymond, I have a feeling there's someone else in this house. No, that isn't. No, there isn't. No one is ever in this house, and I get so lonesome whenever you go out. Don't fret, darling. Next time I go, I'll get rigor mortis to set in. <laughs> Here, have some milk. I know your plan now. You want to do me in with that homogenized Mickey Finn. <laughs> no, no. No, you're wrong. Kiss me. No. I take an oath never to touch you or kiss you again. You're never going to touch her or kiss her again? No. Here, drink some milk, kid. You've got nothing left to live for. Some comedy excerpts uh, from the Philco Radio Hall of Fame, November 26th of 1944, featuring Ray Bolger. And uh, Hildegard was there, and uh, even Paul Whiteman popped up in that. This is Chuck Shaden, our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago, FM 97. We'll be listening to a half-hour Billy Burke show, a uh, Fred Allen show with an excerpt featuring Bert Lahr, a half-hour Seal Test Village store with Jack Haley and Eve Arden, with Hans Conried, Frank Nelson, and Vincent Price, and then an excerpt from a Kraft Music Hall program with Al Jolson and his guest, Judy Garland. Now's the time to subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. The September issue features uh, Jack Armstrong on the cover, Charles Flynn, that is, inside articles from and about the past. A one-year subscription to the newsletter is only $7. You can subscribe now when you call us at 545-2260. September uh, issue features articles about This Is Your FBI, about Gertrude Berg of the Goldbergs, about Benny Goodman at the Palomar Ballroom in Los Angeles in 1935, some TV show advertisements from the 50s, and an article about the westerns produced in Hollywood during the 30s and the 40s. You also get advanced news of our Saturday night movies at Northwest Federal, and tonight we have a couple of good westerns for you, Tom Mix and uh, um, Johnny Mac Brown, and our uh, Saturday listening of our Those Were the Days program with all the information about the shows that we schedule. You can subscribe now, 545-2260. A one-year subscription, 10 issues, just $7. If you call now, we'll begin your subscription with the current September issue, which we'll mail at the beginning of the week. Include an invoice along with your first issue, 545-2260. If you like, you can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But if it's easier, why don't you call us now, right here at our studio, at 545-2260. Subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and radio guide 5452260 Do you remember who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men the shadow knows <laughs> The Golden Days of Radio, brought back once more by Mark 56 Records. What wonderful memories. Relive them again with The Shadow, The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, Burns and Allen. You can buy these and over 100 other original radio broadcasts on Mark 56 LP Records, a gift for remembering. Major Bowes, Tarzan, The Whistler. Hundreds of old-time radio shows on records, cassette tape, and 8-track tapes available at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. We're open Monday through Friday from 11 to 5.30, Saturday till 7.30. We're open right now. We'll be here till, uh, we'll be there till 7.30. And Sundays from noon to 5. We'll be closed on Monday, Labor Day this weekend. Uh, give the boys a break over there, right? <laughs> Metro Golden Memories, the MGM shop. Chuck Shaden here on our Those Were the Days program. And uh, now we have a Billy Burke show for you. Billy Burke played Galinda, the, the uh, nice witch, right? The, the pleasant, the 
beautiful witch. If you want to call her a witch with the magic wand and all that. She was beautiful in this. And she's very funny on this Billy Burke radio show. It's heard on Saturday mornings. And there was a nice lineup of great Saturday morning radio shows. You remember um, Let's Pretend and... Well, I guess uh, in these time, 46, they must have Frank Merriwell and Archie Andrews and Grand Central Station, the Armstrong Theater of today, all of those shows were on. And Billy Burke was a good, funny situation comedy show aimed at the kids, I think, and also at the uh, the housewives who were home in the morning. Saturday morning, Saturdays used to be a day when uh, the, the man folk would be working, right? They'd work five and a half days maybe or even the whole day on Saturday program was sponsored by Listerine Toothpaste. The date of this broadcast is August 3rd of 1946. Marvin Miller is the announcer on this. He was the uh, announcer on the Railroad Hour, and um, he played a million different characters on radio. He's also in the, um, uh, the, the story, too, as a character. Also in the cast are Lillian Randolph and Earl Ross. Lillian Randolph was Beulah on the Gildersleeve show, and Earl Ross was Judge Hooker on the Great Gildersleeve. So I think you may want to, uh, you might enjoy listening to these folks on the Billy Burke Show. This serene toothpaste, that quick-acting, grand-tasting dentifrice with the fresh minty tang, presents the Billy Burke Show. Friends, why don't you enter the Listerine toothpaste contest and win gorgeous nylons of note by Holeproof? Listerine toothpaste is giving away 12 pairs of nylons of note by Holeproof as first prize. Four more prizes of six pairs each and ten extra prizes of two pairs each. There's a different contest every week, but there are only three more contest weeks to go. So send in your entry today. A little later, I'll give you the simple rules for the contest. Right now, here are the five top winners of the sixth week's contest. First prize, 12 pairs of nylons of note by Holdproof went to Mrs. C.A. Grosskopf of Pflugerville, Texas. Six pairs went to Mrs. Charles Alpaw of Princeton, Illinois. Another six pairs to Frederica Gillis of Garner, Iowa. Still another six pairs were won by Mrs. Helen Rudolph of Otisco, Minnesota. And six more pairs went to Mrs. Roland Barillo of Marrero, Louisiana. Listerine toothpaste extends sincere congratulations. <laughs> Smiling, bright morning star, our misleading lady, Miss Billy Burke. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Now let's look in at the little white house on Sunnyview Drive. Brother Julius is working in his shop behind the garage when Miss Burke appears in the doorway. Hello, Julius. Huh? Oh, hello, Billy. <laughs> Julius. What do you want? It's a lovely day. Yes, I know that. <laughs> Julius. What? Uh, you know, you seem to get younger every day. Thank you. Now, please go... And you're so intelligent, you're almost human. That's fine. Now, will you... Oh, wait, wait, Julius. Billy Burke, what's going on? What do you want? Well, I, I want to talk to you. Uh, don't be so impatient. After all, I'm your own flesh and bones. <laughs> the next... All right, all right. What is it? What do you want to talk about? It's something important. I'm, I'm crooking up an idea. But you, you're crooking up an idea? Yes. It's a great start. Julius, I, I need $500. Five? Five? <laughs> What for? Well, the children in the neighborhood need a playground so they won't be out in the street. You know, a place with swings and shoot-the-shooties and merry-go-rounds and a nice big place to play. Well, you can't build one of those things for $500. Oh, yes, I can. Mr. Judson, he will let us use his vacant lot, and for $500, I can get all the things for it. Everything is all arranged and ready. I've taken care of all the details and... All I need is just that little teeny weeny five hundred dollars. There's nothing teeny weeny about five hundred dollars. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Oh, but but think what it will mean to the children. They'll be safe and they'll have so much fun. I know, Billy, and it's a good idea. Uh, but I don't have the five hundred dollars to spare. Why don't you go and talk to Colonel Fitz across the street? He's in the dole. 
In the dough all over with his feet? <laughs> In the money. Go on over. Put the bite on him. I don't understand. Put the bite on him. Heavens, he'd never give it to me if I bit him. <laughs> no, no, no. Talk to him. Ask him. Ask him. Oh, all right. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? Sometimes your grammar is Confucius, my goodness. <laughs> For five hundred dollars, Colonel Fitz, we can build a lovely playground with swings and slides and just everything. Don't you think it's a good idea? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm too old for that sort of thing, Miss Burke. <laughs> I don't expect you to go down the slides, Colonel Fitz. This is for the children of the neighborhood. Oh, for the little time. Yes. Ah, a fine idea, Miss Burke, except uh, I don't have any children. Oh, well, let's not split hairpins. Your children, somebody else's children. What's the difference? The little darlings need a place to play to ventilate their energy. Well, $500 is a lot of money. Well... I tell you what I'll do. You go talk to that old skinflint Guthrie. If he'll put up half, I'll put up the other half. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Colonel Fitz. Well, let's see, half of $500 is, um, <laughs> 250 <laughs> I figured that out in my head. <laughs> I'll get my check. Oh, that's wonderful. You know things are coming back to normal. The factories are making everything, it seems. Really? Yes, Julia says you can even get rubber checks. <laughs> of course, it's probably anesthetic rubber, you know. Uh, undoubtedly. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, Miss Burke, I'll just keep this check until Guthrie puts up his half. But Colonel Fitz... When uh... Guthrie puts up his 250, I'll put up mine. Oh. I couldn't trust that tight wad as far as I could throw a greyhound bus. You, you wouldn't? Oh, I would. I'll still keep my check right here until I see Guthrie's money. All right, Colonel Fitz, but I thought you trusted everybody. Whatever made you think that? Because Julius always says you're a regular confidence man. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Guthrie. Well, how do you do, Miss Burke? To what happy whim of fate do I owe the incomparable pleasure of this unexpected visit? Oh, my, Mr. Guthrie. <laughs> Such a gallant welcome. You, you sound like that poet, Oscar the Wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have an eye for a lovely lady. Well. What can I do for you, Miss Burke? You see, I, uh, I'm raising some money for a children's playground... And Excuse me. <laughs> hello? Oh, hello, sweetie lamb. What? Why, well, I don't know. Uh, Billy Burke's in the office. I'll ask her. Miss Burke, is toothpaste a hyphenated word? Hyphenated? Yes, is there a hyphen in toothpaste? Oh, well, I don't know. I never found one in mine. <laughs> <laughs> hello, sugar doll. No, dear, no hyphen. Goodbye, love. <laughs> Poor Alice. She can't spell. Oh, well, isn't it a shame? Alice had to leave college in her last year. <laughs> now, about this money... Yes, you see, I, I want to build a playground for... Excuse me. Goodness. Hello? Yes, petty pie. Heaven. How do you spell nylon? Well, just a moment, darling. <laughs> Poor Alice, she simply can't spell. How do you spell nylon, Miss Burke? Is it N-I-E or N-E-I? Nylon, let me see. Why? Oh, naturally. It's Y, dear. N-Y-L-O-N. Goodbye, sweet. I suppose you know what Alice is doing, Miss Burke. Oh, oh, yes. Well, think of it, Mr. Guthrie. Twelve pairs of nylons. That's almost a dozen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What were we talking about? The playground. All I need is $250. But... Excuse me, Miss Burke. Oh, yes. Hello? <laughs> yes, Diddy doll. Is there a Y in Listerine, too? Honey Bunch, look on the box. The box. B-O-C-K-S. <laughs> Goodbye, dear. 
gracious. Alice seems to be having trouble. Uh, she doesn't have trouble saying why she likes Listerine toothpaste in 25 words, if she could only spell them. <laughs> now, what do you want the money for, Miss Berg? A playground, P-L-A-Y-G-O. <laughs> well, good heavens, now I'm doing it. <laughs> well, $250 is quite a lot of money. Oh, but it's for a good cause, Mr. Guthrie. Think of it, a whole playground with slides and teeter totterers for all the children in the neighborhood. Not a bad idea. We could charge admission. Admission? Why not? Ten cents a head. Oh, well, that wouldn't work. The children would want to get more than their heads in. <laughs> you, you mean charge them to use the slides and things? It might be quite a paying proposition. Oh, no, no, Mr. Guthrie. The playground is to be free. In fact, I'm going to call it the free for all. Who's putting up the other 250? Your old friend, Colonel Fitz. You know, Fitzy? That old windbag? Mm -hmm. All right, if Fitz will put up 250, I'll put up 250. But he says he'll put his 250 up if you put up yours. Aha. Uh -huh. He's trying to pull a fast one, huh? Not one cent do I put in until I see his money. Oh, but who's going to put up the money first so that the other one can see it? Not me. You show me his check and you can have mine. Well, I'll ask him, but I know what he's going to say. No, no. But somebody has to put up the money. Oh, first, oh, Colonel Fitz. It won't be me. I know that, Guthrie. Probably trying to pull one of his slick deals. Well, he won't catch me. He's not trying to catch anybody. He just wants to see your check. All right, I want to see his. Guthrie is a crook. As far as I'm concerned, we can simply forget about the whole thing. But we must have the playground. We can't forget about then it. Then show me Guthrie's money. Oh, why do you men have to be so bully-headed? Uh, well, now, what are you going to do? I'm going home and think. And when I start thinking, something's going to happen. You home, Miss Billy? Yes, I'm home, Daisy. Mm, you don't sound too bright. Something wrong? Oh, I'm mad at men. At men? That takes in a lot of people. Well, I'm mad at two men in particular. That Mr. Guthrie and that Colonel Fitz. <gasps> I'll show them. I'll think of something. While you was gone, a couple of little boys came to the door and they wanted to know how the playground was going. Oh, poor darlings. Well, I'm going to build that playground, Daisy, if I have to resort to despicable measures. If Mr. Guthrie and Colonel Fitz are going to be stubborn, they'll wish they hadn't. I'll show them two can play as cheaply as one. <laughs> well, Billy, how'd you come out? Oh, not so good. As sailors say, I ran into a snood. It's a snood? You mean a snag. Oh, snag, snood, no, oh, it's all the same. Mr. Guthrie won't put up his money until the Colonel puts up his, and Colonel Fitz won't give me his check until he sees Mr. Guthrie's money. It's so ridiculous, just a tempest in a tea room. <laughs> you shouldn't have told Guthrie that Fitz was in on it. What? They're having one of their annual feuds. Oh, fiddlesticks on their old feuds. I'll get them together somehow. You want to be careful, Billy. You get those uh, two in the same room and there'll be a fight. Fight? Billy Burke, what are you thinking about? I have an inspiration. Now look, none of your willy-nilly ideas. Oh, you wait, Julius. This is a willy-nilly dilly. <laughs> Friends, there are only three weeks left in the Listerine Toothpaste Contest, the easy contest in which the prizes are beautiful nylons of note by Holdproof. So send in your entry today. Here are the rules. One, complete the following sentence in 25 words or less. I like Listerine Toothpaste because... Two, write or print your entry together with your name, address, and stocking size. Be sure to also include your leg length, short, medium, or long. Three, enclose the side or facsimile of the side of a Listerine Toothpaste box. But, and this is important, the side you enclose must be the one that carries the good housekeeping seal. Mail your entry, as many entries as you like, to Listerine Contest, Post Office Box 491, Times Square, New York 18, New York. Remember, first prize is a dozen pairs of nylons of note by Holproof, four other prizes of six pairs each, and ten more prizes of two pairs apiece.
Thank you, Marvin Miller. On the Billy Burke Show, comedy show for a Saturday morning on a Saturday afternoon with just a few years in between. The original broadcast, August 3rd of 1946. I'm Chuck Shaden, WNIB Chicago FM 97 is the place where you're at, and uh, this is called Those Were the Days, a rerun of the best of the past on the good old days of radio. The fine family of Paterno offers you a selection of fine wines from the vineyards of the world. From California to France, from Italy to Portugal, you'll find the Paterno wine cellar stocked with the widest selection of wines from all the best places. Paterno Foremost Liquors, 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. It's the largest beverage store of its kind in all Chicagoland. A visit to the Paterno wine cellar is an experience you won't forget, and you'll return often to keep your own wine cellar stocked. Whether it's an intimate candlelit dinner for two or an important dinner party for quite a few, you'll find everything you need to add the word special to your next occasion. Visit the wine cellar at Paterno Foremost Liquors, open Monday through Saturday from 9 in the morning till 10 at night, Sunday from noon to 6. Paterno Foremost Liquors at 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. Now let's return to the uh, last half of the Billy Burke Show. Miss Burke's plan to build a playground for the neighborhood youngsters has run into financial problems. Mr. Guthrie and Colonel Fitz were going to advance $250 apiece, but each has insisted the other put up his money first. However, Miss Burke seems to think she's found a solution. Billy Burke, where are you going? I'm off to see the lizard. Two lizards, in fact. L lizard? Now, wait a minute. I'm going to see Mr. Guthrie and Colonel Fitz. Simply because they're having a feud isn't going to keep the children from having a playground. I'm going to outsmart them. What are you going to do? I'm going to show them that I'm not the babe in the wood pile that they think. <laughs> now, just a minute, Billy. Think. Remember what always happens when you get these wild ideas. But there's nothing wild about this idea. I'm simply going to fight fire with fire water. Tell me what you're up to. Come on. I'm going to get the $500 for that playground. How? Well, you just bridle your time. Everything comes to him who's the waiter. <laughs> I know Guthrie and Colonel Fitz, and I'll just bet you that you don't get the money. Oh, well, you wait and see. Remember the old Greek proverb, Julius, my time is your time. <laughs> Mr. Guthrie, I'm back again. Well, did that old baboon put up his money? Baboon? Oh, oh Colonel Fitz. No, no, he didn't. You know, Mr. Guthrie, when I told him what you said, he simply flew into a tizzy. A what? A tizzy. That's something like a transom. Oh, he did, huh? <laughs> the conniving old coot. I'm surprised at Colonel Fitz, Mr. Guthrie. Goodness, he said some... Oh, some dreadful things about you. About me? Mm. Well, what did he say? Oh, I, I couldn't repeat them. Makes me shudder <laughs> to think he'd say such thing behind your face. Well, what did he say? Tell me, tell me. No, um, I couldn't. Well, very well, then. Let it go. Don't you want to hear it? Oh, indeed I do. <laughs> well, don't breathe this to a simple soul. But Colonel Fitz said he wouldn't trust you as far as he could throw a bus. What? Yes, and furthermore, he thinks you're a skinny flint. He calls me a skinny flint? Now, don't do anything rational, Mr. Guthrie. Remember, Colonel Fitz is a great big man. I'm not afraid of him. Why, I'll mutilate that two-faced old crook. Oh, you don't mean that really, Mr. Guthrie. I do mean it. I'll hammer that beanpole down to a fire plug. No, no, you're just... <laughs> you're just joking. You'll forget all about it. Forget about it, mm -hmm. huh? Listen, I'll be out at Fitz's house in 15 minutes, and we'll see then who's joking. Goodness, you frighten me, Mr. Guthrie. Oh, I think I'll run along. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, dear, 15 minutes. Well, I'll have to hustle, bustle, rustle. Couldn't... Well, Miss Burke, what did old Guthrie say? Oh, Colonel Fitz, I, I can't tell you. It was too dreadful. <laughs> Wouldn't put up his money, eh? 
I thought as much. Well, it wasn't that. It, it was a perfectly awful thing that he said about you. Uh, about me? I don't think he's your friend. What did he say? He intimated that you were dishonest. Intimated? Yes, he said you were a crook with two faces. Why, that old weasel. He's, uh, he's coming out here to hammer you into a fire plug. A fire plug? I, uh, I thought you should know. Well, let him come. I'll show you. There he is at the door. I, I, I'll go out the back way, Colonel Fitz. No need to fear. I'll handle him in short notice. Well, don't fight in the house, Colonel. Hello, Fitz, you scoundrel. I've been waiting for you, Guthrie. Put up your fists. I'm going to punch you right in the nose. You no, know, you think so, huh? Come out in the yard, Fitz. Put up your fists. I'm coming at you, Guthrie. I'm boys, coming at you. Boys, boys, stop. Oh, who's that? Who's that? Heavens, Mr. Guthrie, and you, Colonel Fitz, fighting out in the front yard like common raggedy muffins? Oh, shame on you. Stand aside, Miss Burke. Don't try to protect him, Miss Burke. I'm going to... Oh, no, you're not. Now, you both listen to me. If you're going to fight, you must fight like gentlemen and scholars. Haven't you heard of the Marcus and Queensberry? Just let me at him. Just let me at now, him. Now, hush. I know you boys have, can make a real nice fight and settle your drudge and everything. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do. Daisy? Oh, Daisy! Come in, Oh, hurry, Daisy. I have wonderful news. What's doing? Oh, everything's turned out splendidly, Daisy. We have to hurry and put some mattresses out in the backyard. Mattresses in the backyard? What for? For the wrestling match. Groaning Guthrie versus Furious Fitz. You mean them two men go wrestle against each other in the backyard? Absolutely. Isn't it wonderful? With the flowers growing all around, it'll be just like Madison Square Garden. Are you kidding, Miss Billy? Kidding? Heavens no. We're going to have a real middleweight wrestling match. I'm sure that's what it will be. They both have all their weight around the middle. <laughs> well, I have all the mattresses, but I still don't get it. Well, there's nothing to get, Daisy, except the mattresses. Oh, it's simplicity myself. Mr. Guthrie and Colonel Fitz were mad at each other, and one wouldn't put up money for the playground until the other did, so I sort of, uh, well, <laughs> brought them together, you know. Now they're going to settle their feud with a wrestling match. The loser puts up the $500 for the playground. That's what's going to happen? No fooling? No fooling. I thought it up all by myself. What's all this about a wrestling match? Oh, Julius, I, I have the money for the playground. Where is it? Well, I mean, I have it digitally speaking. Oh, Mr. Guthrie is going to wrestle Colonel Fitz in the backyard. The one who gets pinned to the mattress pays for the playground. No! Yes, it's all arranged. The bout starts at 7 o'clock this evening. Isn't that nice? Let's call it Ronin in the morning. In the gloaming. Ronin in the gloaming. Now, let me get it right. This beats anything I ever heard of. How did you cook it up? I didn't cook anything. I simply told Mr. Guthrie what Colonel Fitz said and told Colonel Fitz what Mr. Guthrie said and first thing you know, they were doing what comes naturally. <laughs> Fitz and Guthrie wrestling. You know, Billy, sometimes I think you're a genius. Really? Yeah, other times I think other things. What? <laughs> Who's going to referee? Oh, I am. You're going to be the umpire and clock watcher, and Daisy is going to be the press. That's who I'm going to be the press? Mm -hmm, the press. You're going to be the reporter and photographer. I bought some films for the brownie so you can take pictures. This is going to be a big wrestling match. We have to have all the trimmings. Leaping lizards! We ought to sell tickets. Why, we could get a thousand dollar gate. Well, there's no use in paying that much for a gate. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, it must be absolutely private. No audience participation. <laughs> now, you and Daisy get the mattresses down from upstairs. I have to phone the playground equipment company and tell them to deliver our slides and swings and things. Uh, wait a minute. You better wait until you get the money. What if something goes wrong? What can go wrong, Julia? Well, what if they change their minds and don't wrestle? Oh, uh, they won't. They're mad at each other. Oh, they're going to fight like two tummy pussies. <laughs> Come on, Fitz and Guthrie are ready. Gracious, I'm all in a fluster. How do 
you referee a wrestling match, Julia? Oh, don't ask me. It's your idea. Come on, well, come on. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, Colonel Fitz. Mr. Guthrie. Let's get on with the match. I'm raring to go. I'm going to take you apart. Oh, Guthrie. now, now, boys. Be nice. I'm the referee, and when I say don't do something, you don't do it. Is that clear? Yes, yes. Now, no fair biting or scratching, remember that. Just use good, clean strangle holes. <laughs> and remember, the one who loses has to pay the $500 for the playground. Is that clear? Yes, we understand. Let's rest and let's go. All right. <laughs> in this corner, in the beige trunks, we have the muscular monster, Emil Guthrie. Thank you, thank you. And in this corner, in the chartreuse trunks, we have that swordfish fighter, Colonel Fitz. Uh, All right, Mr. Bryce. Fitz, ring the bell. Come on, Fitz. Come on, go after him, Guthrie. Now I'm going to get you, Fitz. Your goose is cooked. Just let me get my hands on you, Now, Guthrie. now, be nice, boys. Goodness, don't keep walking around each other. You're making me dizzy. Gracious, somebody wrestle somebody. Well, I'll just wait till I get hold of it. Oh, <laughs> no. Give him the oil hat. Oh. Ow! Colonel Finn, you stop your hurting him. Leave him alone, Billy. Crawl out of it, Guthrie. Come on, I give know. him a toehold. Julius, stop, stop telling them those things to do. Ooh, oh. Ooh, oh, Mr. No. Mrs. Guthrie, are you biting him? Yes, I've got him now. Oh, 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 I have it. Oh. Watch him, Billy. Guthrie's down. I'm not down, he's down. Oh, heavens, I can't tell who's down. They're all mixed up. Well, somebody's down. Oh, it's well, not me. My shoulders aren't down. Well, I can't tell who's who. Is that your foot, Mr. Guthrie? No, it's not mine. Well, it's not mine either. Well, good. <laughs> heavens, whose is it? Come on, wrestle, wrestle. I can't move. Let go of me, Fitz. You let go of me first. Well, great, somebody let go. How did you get so all tangled up? What a wrestling match. Come on, fight. Well, how can they wrestle, Julius? They don't even know which one is which. Get me out of this, somebody. This is ridiculous. Where is my other hand? That's my hand. Oh, Julius, Julius, come and help. We have to sort them out. Good night. Oh, what a mess. Oh, goodness. But there are too many feet for just two men. Maybe we'd better count them. One. Who, whose idea was this, anyway? Wasn't my idea. Well, it's a lot of foolishness. <laughs> Help me out of here. Oh. Well, we're trying. Come on, take a hold of that foot, Billy. Goodness. We'll push it under this knee. Oh. Yeah. Well, what will I do with his arm? <laughs> uh, there's an elbow here that doesn't belong to anybody. Well, do something, will you? Pull, pull. Oh, there now. All the parts came out even. Oh. oh, my back. And my knee. Are you all are you all through wrestling? Yes. Definitely. But, but who won? Nobody. We'll call it a draw, huh, Guthrie? A draw? Oh, you can't do that. Who'll pay the $500 for the playground? Nobody. Nothing what? was said about a draw. Nobody wins, nobody pays, huh, Fitzy? <laughs> exactly right, old man. Well, Billy, oh. I told you something had happened. Now, what are you going to do? Oh, well, we can buy a few things for the playground, I think. <laughs> well, you get the money. Not from us. <laughs> no, no, not from you. From the newspapers. Daisy, did you get the pictures? I took the whole row. That should be the greatest wrestling match in history. Oh, splendid. Well, we'll sell them to the newspapers for a few pitiful pennies, I suppose. Goodbye, Mr. Guthrie. Goodbye, Colonel oh, Fitz. Uh, just a moment. Hold on. I won't have those ridiculous pictures in the paper. Make us the laughing stock of the town. Well, the pictures are for sale, gentlemen. Do I hear any offer? Um, I'll give you fifty dollars. <laughs> you will not have any pictures of me for fifty dollars. I'll give you a hundred. Oh, a blackmailer, huh? Five hundred. A thousand. You crook, Guthrie! Now, now, quiet, both of you. Here's what we'll do. If you'll each contribute five hundred dollars to the playground, I'll smash the camera. Now then, nobody will see the pictures. Is it a bargain? I'm putting the camera in for nothing. Well... It's robbery, but I'll pay. Me too. Where's that camera? Here it is. <laughs> All right, Julius. You can jump on the camera. A brand new brownie. Come on, Julius. Jump. Jump, All jump, right. jump. There we are. Now we'll go in the house and write the checks. Oh. 
Come along, chump. I'm coming, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> it serves them right, Billy. If they'd have shelled out their money in the first place, they'd have been all right. Julius, am I doing a bad thing? No, indeed. The kids need the playground, and those guys can afford it. Take their money. But, Julius, I... I just remembered something. What? Please, don't tell a simple soul, will you? What? I forgot to put the film in the camera. <laughs> Friends, get in the Listerine contest now and win nylons of note by Holdproof. There are only three more weeks to go. Now here are the simple rules again. One, complete the following sentence in 25 words or less. I like Listerine toothpaste because... Two, write or print your entry together with your name, address, and stocking size. Be sure to also include your leg length, short, medium, or long. Three, enclose the side or facsimile of the side of a Listerine toothpaste box. But, and this is important, the side you enclose must be the one that carries the good housekeeping seal. Mail your entry to Listerine Contest, Post Office Box 491, Times Square, New York 18, New York. Independent judges will award prizes for originality, interest, and sincerity. Duplicate prizes in case of ties. Judge's decision will be final and no entries will be returned. All entries and ideas submitted become the property of Lambert Pharmacal Company. The contest is open to all except employees of Lambert Pharmacal Company and associated companies. Why not get in this easy contest today? Mail your entry to Listerine Contest, Post Office Box 491, Times Square, New York 18, New York. Goodbye, Goodbye everybody, till next Saturday. And remember to always look for the silver lining and try to find the sunny side of life. Produced by Axel Gruenberg. Today's story was written by Paul West. The part of Daisy is played by Lillian Randall, and Earl Ross is our Julius. Music is under the direction of Carl Bonowitz. Tune in again next Saturday when the makers of Listerine Toothpaste again present The Billy Burke Show. For the best in Saturday listening, don't forget, let's pretend Billy Burke Show and Armstrong's Theater of Today. This is Amy Guthrie speaking. Or if you prefer, Colonel Ritz. Both of which are really your announcer, Marvin Miller. <laughs> this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Billy Burke Show from August 3rd of 1946, starring the witch Galinda from The Wizard of Oz, Billy Burke. She was also, uh, she was married to Florian Ziegfeld uh, for a number of years, and I suspect that's where the uh, theme song was, uh, theme music here, Look for the Silver Lining. Oh, that was uh, Marilyn Miller, though, actually. Marilyn Miller uh, sang Look for the Silver Lining. I don't know, quite know what the connection was, but at any rate, that's what it was. By the way, at the beginning of the show, I said that uh, Lillian Randolph played uh, Beulah on the Gildersleeve show. Uh, it was a slip of the tongue. She played Birdie. Birdie was the maid on the uh, the great Gildersleeve show. Billy Burke uh, from The Wizard of Oz. We're playing uh, radio shows today uh, starring many of the stars of The Wizard of Oz, the classic 1939 MGM musical. Judy Garland was Dorothy, Ray Bolger the Scarecrow, Jack Haley the Tin Man, Bert Lahr the Cowardly Lion, Frank Morgan the Wizard himself, and Billy Burke Glinda. And uh, we'll have, uh, we're going to be hearing from Bert Lahr in just a little bit. Then we have a Jack Haley Village Store program and an excerpt from a craft music hall with Judy Garland and uh, Al Jolson. It was a great movie. It really was a fantastic film, and um, no matter how many times you've seen it, you know, you can just sit and uh, enjoy it uh, over and over. It will be as much a, a part of um, 
Well, you know, relating The Wizard of Oz to television, now it's been on television every year for the last 20 years. The Wizard of Oz being shown on television will be to this, the same, mean the same to the TV generation that the cinnamon bear meant to those of us who grew up every Christmas with the cinnamon bear during those uh, those years of the 40s. Speaking of great movies, we got the, these are not great movies, but they sure are goodies from the good old days of uh, Hollywood at the Memory Movie tonight over at Northwest Federal Savings. Uh, our B-Movie Festival this week and next week begins tonight with the Western Night, Destry Rides Again, starring Tom Mix, 1932, Shoot 'em Up. And from 1942, more Blazing Guns, The Boss of Hangtown Mesa, starring Johnny Mac Brown with Al Fuzzy Knight. A double header tonight, a double feature. All that plus some popcorn. <laughs> and you, What more could you ask of an evening, huh? Uh, you want to find out who likes all those westerns? Come to the memory movie tonight and you'll find out. You look around, you see, oh my gosh, it's not just me, huh? It's all these other people. Well, we've got them tonight. I hope you'll come, too. Uh, doors open at 730 Film begins at 8 o'clock. Uh, donation is a dollar and a quarter per person, with all proceeds being donated to recognized charities. The film is shown in the Northwest Federal Savings Community Center Auditorium in the building at 4901 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. Plenty of parking at the lot in the rear of the office on Dakin Street. That's where you how you enter the community center, through the parking lot there. If you come by CTA, you can get off the right on um, Lamont and Irving. It's a block west of uh, Six Corners, west of Sears there, west of Cicero. Uh, just walk along the side of the building uh, and then come around the back, and then you'll be able to come in and uh, and get a nice seat and have a good time. We'll be there tonight, and I hope you will join us for Destry Rides Again, and Tom Mix starring in the 1932 flick, plus Johnny Mac Brown and L. Fuzzy Knight in The Boss of Hangtown Mesa from 1942. Well, from movies to... Um, to detectives, as we roll now to a clip for you from our cassette tape of the month, for September, this is uh, from uh, this is a clip from one of two Sherlock Holmes adventures from Mutual Radio back in 1945. Here's a clip from the Great Gandalfo. Why did we have to leave Holmes? I was having a wonderful time. I'm sorry to drag you away, Watson, but there's work to be done. Mr. Holmes, if you want to go backstage, I'll introduce you to Miss Lasseur. Oh, that's a splendid idea. Yeah, before we do that, Mr. Travers, there's one important fact I want to know. What is it, sir? I presume you have a dossier of the available facts concerning this spy? Yes, sir. Everything that we've been able to find out. Among that evidence, do you by any chance have any fingerprint records? Yes, sir, I do. Splendid. Then we'll go at once to the nearest police station and compare the fingerprints on this glass with those in your possession. Where did you get that glass, Holmes? You remember that Miss Lasseur, before she entered that cabinet on the stage, handed Gandolfo a glass of water. You mean that's the glass? Why else should I be carrying a drinking glass with me, old chap? Very neat, Mr. Holmes, and right under the nose of a magician, too. Well, I'm not exactly inept to the practice of uh, leisure domain myself, Mr. Travers. Come on, let's have a talk with that local fingerprint expert. <laughs> And that's a scene from one of two great Sherlock Holmes adventures that you'll get this month on our cassette tape of the month for September. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce star in a pair of 1945 Petri Wine broadcasts from Mutual. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, two of the best back-to-back -back on a single cassette tape for only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Great adventure with Holmes and Watson in A Scandal in Bohemia and The Great Gandolfo, a brand new cassette tape for your good old collection. A Sherlock Holmes double header, only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can get your tape at any of the six offices of Northwest Federal Savings, or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce star in two rare radio adventures of Sherlock Holmes, our cassette tape of the month for September, $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. This is Chuck Shaden on WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Our program is Those Were the Days. We're with you every Saturday afternoon from 1 until 5. And uh, today we're listening in to radio programs featuring the stars of The Wizard of Oz. Next in line is... Uh, is the Cowardly Lion. It's Bert Lahr. He uh, uh, did a f fabulous performance as the Lion in The Wizard of Oz. 
And we have from a Fred Allen radio show from October 11th of 1939, about a ten and a half minute excerpt uh, from uh, Allen's second show of the season, being, uh, uh, featuring the cowardly lion himself, Mr. Bert Lahr. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present our invited guest, a man who comes to glorify the evening, a comedian. <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute, Harry. Try to hold in. <laughs> well, I can't hold in, Fred. I just saw him outside. Does he look funny? <laughs> yes. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this hilarious chap is... <laughs> oh, now, Portland. I saw him in the Wizard of Oz. Oh, boy, is he a wow. Quiet, quiet, you two. That guy's a riot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what everybody says, folks. Meet the funniest man in the world, Bert Law. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. You're a stream, Mr. Law. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, everybody, for this boisterous welcome. <laughs> well, well, Bert, you're the funniest man in the world, so I'm going to keep quiet now and just let you get funny. Well, Fred, I... Uh, uh, let's go, Bertie, old boy. Well, uh, <laughs> This is embarrassing, Fred. Uh, I don't know how to tell you. Why, you tell me what, Bert? I don't feel funny. <laughs> After that, pilled up, you don't feel funny. Uh, yes, just one of those things, I guess. I was funny all morning. I had the chambermaid screaming around the hotel. <laughs> the two I caught. Well, if you were funny around the... Uh... I, I was funny all afternoon. You were? Over in Lindy's, a fly flew in my soup. Yeah? I called the waiter over and said... <laughs> <laughs> Take this soup spoon and bring me a fly swatter. <laughs> Did they laugh? Laugh. <laughs> Twenty diners dropped their racing forms. <laughs> That's what I can't understand, Fred. All day long, you might say, I've, I've been a pixie on the wing, a gay blade, a, a spontaneous pantaloon. But right now, I, I don't, don't feel, feel funny. funny. I heard you on Bing Crosby's program, Mr. Lahr. And you were witty. I was brilliant, Portland. <laughs> Remember that gag I told about the two patients meeting in Mayo's clinic? <laughs> the face patient says... The, oh, this will kill you. <laughs> the face patient says, I'm aching from neuritis. And the second patient says, <laughs> I'm Mandelbaum from Chicago. <laughs> Yeah, I was a rowdy that night. <laughs> I was in the groove with Crosby. Well, you don't. I, I can't understand what's, uh, what's the matter with you tonight. You don't think it's something mental. But... Mental with me? <laughs> Quit kidding. <laughs> well, you know, it could be your libido, Bert. Yeah, maybe it's my subconscious. Maybe I ought to see a psychoamethyst or something. <laughs> you know, with Crosby, I was another man. Oh, and could we use the other man right now? <laughs> I can't understand why you can be funny with Crosby and with me, nothing... Well, I don't know, Fred. I, I, I think I like to work with Bing. He, he gives me something. Well, I'm giving you something. Yeah, but with Bing, it was money. <laughs> I see what you mean. You, in other words, are averse to butter. Look, I'm broad-minded, Fred, but after all... <laughs> What can I do with 200 tubes of toothpaste? <laughs> yes, I get your uh, your point, Bert. After all... <laughs> I'm a point killer. After all, if you don't feel funny, let's forget the comedy tonight. We'll just kibitz around and chew the fat. You know, the public can't always expect a comedian to be funny. That's what I say. People think if one comedian is funny... Two comedians should be twice as funny. Oh, it's silly. Now, here we are, you and I. You're a comedian, and I'm a comedian. We're together. Are we twice as funny? To the contrary. To corner phrase. <laughs> to corner phrase. Well, let's stop the whole thing. Say, how come you left Hollywood, Bert? You must have had a reason. Yes, Fred. Hollywood went too far. It was up to me. Well, wh what, what did you do? It was my turn to go too far. <laughs> so I got on a train and came east. Oh, you mean out there you were getting in a rut artistically? Yeah, I was tired of being a great lover. You, want <laughs> you wanted to get away from it all? Well, most of it. There was a little blonde at Metro who might have intrigued me, but 
The silly, silly little minx let me get away. <laughs> Say, you must have taken it hard. I was momentarily frustrated. Really? I renounced the human race. I sought solace in the animal kingdom. Oh, and that is how you came to play the lion in The Wizard of Oz? I would have played a flea on Bulldog Drummond. <laughs> well, you certainly did a swell job, Bert. You still look like a lion to me. That's the trouble. I got too far into character. <laughs> Why, I was even starting to molt. <laughs> I, uh, I can tell by the top of your head that... <laughs> Well, are you continuing your animal characterization? Not me. I'm, I'm sick of making a living on all fours. I want to play Ibsen, Chekhov, Odette. You know, one of those parts where I keep sipping cyanide of potassium all through the second act. <laughs> well, do you really think you can play one of those serious roles? Why not? What have I got that if John Barrymore had, he'd get rid of right away? <laughs> well, why, why should a successful comedian want to play tragedy? Oh, I'm a ham at heart, Fred. Give me a pair of spats, a bamboo cane, and a nod from all of Hampton, <laughs> and I'm in ecstasy. Say, what do you expect to do when you retire, Bert? Oh, I don't know. I may open a small toll bridge or something. <laughs> Well, now that we know your ambitions, what are you going to do here in the East besides fend off senility? I'm going into a new musical show, a sequel to Amphitryon 39. What's it called? Butterfield 4230. <laughs> Does the uh, show look like a hit? Oh, yes. It's a little gem. <laughs> We're rehearsing in Tiffany's window. <laughs> you're, uh, you're playing the lead, of course. No, it's just a bit. 92 sides. A bit. Yeah, I'm on the stage two hours before the play begins. <laughs> I'm ever-present, but unimportant. Well, what sort of a show is it, Bert? Well, the best way I can describe it is, uh, it's a 17th century hell's a poppin It is. I thought hell's a poppin went farther back than that. <laughs> some of those shows. Well, what, uh, what character do you assume? Well, in the first act, I'm a subdued knave. A subdued knave. In the second act, I'm a tippet mender. Oh, you men tip it to you? <laughs> and in the last act, I play Gaspard Levine, the muscle man in a bistro. <laughs> you run the artistic uh, gamut, as it were. Yes. I range from the tentatively foul to the delightfully obnoxious. <laughs> in other words, you ignore the audience's heartstrings to get right to their nostrils. To put it bluntly, yes. <laughs> My big scene is in the second act. As the tippet mender, I am discovered in Madame Pompadour's hope chest. Uh -huh. The king is bibbing in the anteroom. A Florentine enters. I suspect poltroonery. I chide Pompadour. When she is well chidden, <laughs> I degrade her. She is choose me. I gesundheit her. <laughs> the Florentine offers to roll the dice for Pompadour's favors. The dice are cogs. I'm undone. Curtain. Just in time. It sounds like a great play, Bert. Yes, they just grabbed the author for observation. <laughs> uh, are, you, uh, are you singing in this show, Bert? Well, nothing to speak of. Uh, I cajole Madame Pompadour with a chansonnette. You do? Yeah. Well, say, how about a little chanson uh, <laughs> now, before you go? I hoped you would ask me to sing tonight, Fred. I yeah. really did. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Why? I want to get even with a guy in St. Paul. <laughs> and what form is your revenge taking, Bert? Well, I'll catch up with an old request. Roses of Picardy. Roses of Picardy. Wait a minute, he's lost the words. Wait a minute, Peter. <laughs> I've got him, friend. Roses are shining in a Picardy in the hush of the silver dew. Roses are flowing in the Picardy, but there's never a rose like you. 
and the roses will die with the summertime, and our rose may be far farther apart. <laughs> but there's a one a rose that dies a lot in a Picardy. That I keep in my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A wire has just come in from the management of the Baldwin Locomotive Works. <laughs> Bert Lahr opens with Unit 701 <laughs> next Thursday morning. Uh, thank you, Bert. That's Bert Lahr with Fred Allen, or Fred Allen with Bert Lahr on a Allen show from uh, October 11th of 1939. Bert Lahr, of course, was the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz. This is Chuck Shaden, our Those Were the Days program on WNIB, Chicago FM 97. The in footwear for young men and women this season is Welco High Pels hiking boots, and for good reason. They're snug, warm, and durable, besides being fashionable. Your headquarters for Welco High Pels hiking boots is the Paul Meyer Shoe Store at 2924 Central Street in Evanston. The Paul Meyer Shoe Store has them in all sizes, and remember that Welco High Pels hiking boots have vulcanized construction to ensure flexibility. For hiking boots, it's Welco High Pels, and for Welco, it's the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston. Northwest Federal Summertime, Summertime. It's Northwest Federal Summertime, Summer Saving Time. Ah, sun, fun, and song. People have lots of ways to spend summertime, and Northwest Federal gives you lots of ways to save. Choose one of 23 gifts free or for special low prices when you deposit $250 or more at any Northwest Federal Savings Center. There's an Igloo ice chest, a Weber grill, a Norelco gotcha hair dryer, a Sunbeam hand mixer, and other gifts to help make summer savings a little easier. So when summer's over, you'll have more than a suntan to show. So sing! It's Northwest Federal Summertime, 63 hours a week, summertime. Earlier this afternoon on our program, we heard uh, a clip from a uh, Philco Hall of Fame with Jack Haley doing kind of a stand-up comedy routine and some singing and uh, other silliness like that. Now we have Jack Haley as the star of his own radio show. Uh, he was, of course, the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. This is a broadcast from uh, March 20th of 1947, sponsored by Seal Test Products. Jack Haley stars in the Seal Test Village store with Eve Arden, Hans Conried, Frank Nelson is here, and uh, their special guest is Vincent uh, uh, Price. So I think you'll have some fun with this. Uh, and Vincent Price, in a hillbilly sketch at the end of the show, even sings a song, which would be a rather rare thing. So I hope you'll enjoy uh, part one of the Seal Test Village Store. <laughs> The Seal Test Milk and Ice Cream Divisions of National Dairy present Jack Haley in the Seal Test Village Store with manager Eve Arden, our singing star Bob Stanton, and our guest tonight, Vincent Price, and starring Jack Haley. There comes a time in every businessman's life when he feels that he should turn to something more important. Jack Haley is no exception. He has turned to the study of music. And as we look in on the Seal Test Village store, we find him telling Eve Arden all about it. So you're going to study music, hmm, Jack? Yes, I am, Eve. I'm going over to Nelson's Easy Lesson Music School and take my first lesson on the ukulele. The ukulele? Well, why a passe instrument like the ukulele? Well, because of a frustration I had when I was in college. In those days, all the fellows played the ukulele except me. My mother made me study the trombone. 
Well, what's wrong with the trombone? Well, it's not a very romantic instrument. The other guys would take their girls out in a canoe, sit opposite them, and play the ukulele. I couldn't do that with a trombone. <laughs> <laughs> My girl took an awful beating. Oh, well, I, I know what that poor girl went through. Oh, you don't know. I You're used to go out with a guy who played the tuba. He used to take me canoeing on the lake and serenade me with the tuba. Serenade you with a tuba? How did it sound? I wouldn't know. Every time he hit a high note, he blew me out of the boat. <laughs> I'm going over to Nelson soon to start my ukulele lessons. I want you to come along, Eve, and... Oh, look who just came in. Virginia Martin. You know, Eve, I think she kind of likes me. Oh, don't be a fool, Jack. That stage-struck dame is making a fuss over you only because she thinks you can help her with her career. Hello, Mr. Haley. Hello, Miss Martin. Hello, Mrs. Arden. Now, wait a minute. How many times do I have to tell you it's Miss, not Mrs.? I'm not married. How come you've never been married? Well, it's just a matter of supply and demand. <laughs> What I'm supplied with, there's no demand for. I'm sorry, Virginia, but you'll have to excuse us. Uh, Eve and I were just leaving for Nelson's music school. You see, I'm going to learn to play the ukulele. Ukulele? Oh, I'm disappointed in you, Jack. I should think a man of, of your intelligence and position would choose a more dignified instrument. Well, what would you suggest? I'd suggest you take up the flute. Yeah, that... <laughs> Uh, the what? The float. The float. What? Do you by any chance mean the flute? Oh, please, Miss Arden. That is the plebeian pronunciation. We of the theater pronounce flute as flout. Well, what do you know? <laughs> Excuse me, I'll be right back. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to put a nickel in the joust box and hear Gene Kraupo play Sow City Sow. <laughs> See, I wish you'd take up the flop, Jack. You uh, see, how do you do? How I, do you do that? I mean, I, I play the harpsichord, and when you come over Sunday night, we can have a flop and harpsichord duet. Farewell. Eve, I'm going to follow Virginia's advice. After all, a man hasn't lived until he's become the flout half of a flout and harp. <laughs> Well, i better get over to Nelson's music school. Are you coming with me, Eve? All right, I'll go with you and try to help Nelson talk you into something more modern than the ukulele. That's so old-fashioned. Now, never that. mind. Let's go. <laughs> Say, this is... <laughs> Came in on a no-ball there. Say, this is a big place Nelson's got here. Yes, but most of the students are children. Aren't you going to feel silly taking lessons here? No, I won't. I wonder where Nelson is. How do you do? Oh. <laughs> Welcome to Nelson's Easy Method Music School. How do you do? Are you Mr. Nelson? Uh, yes, I am, madam. And what instrument would you like to have your little son here take out? <laughs> my son? Oh, yes, my son. Smart-looking little schmo, isn't he? <laughs> Not her son. Oh, all right. We teach all instruments. Now, what instrument would you like to learn to play, and why did you pick the harmonica? I didn't. I want to learn to play the ukulele. What the heck is a ukulele? It's a musical instrument that's shaped like a, uh, it's, uh, like, well, it's shaped like that big instrument standing over there in the corner. What big instrument? That clumsy shaped one. See it there? The one with the long neck and the wide top? It narrows a little toward the middle and then broadens out again. What do you call that thing? Mabel, it's my wife. <laughs> Well, a ukulele looks like Mabel with strings. Yes. Uh, look, Haley, we have just the instrument you should take up, the harmonica. But I don't want to learn to play the harmonica. Nobody's asking you. Just sit down and listen to our famous harmonica teacher, Leo Diamond, play something. I don't want to hear the harmonica. Oh, keep quiet. <laughs> what are you going to play, Leo? Well, I like to play my version of Waiting for the Robert E. Lee. Well, play it, Leo, play it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
There, wasn't that beautiful? Yeah, yeah, it was very nice, but I don't want to play the harmonica. I want to learn to play the ukulele. We specialize in the harmonica, and that's what you're going to play. Now just sit down over there with those other people until you cool off and see things our way. I'll be back. Never that guy insisting that I play the harmonica. Well, I won't do it. Oh, stop making a scene, Jack. Now let's sit down over here. All right, if there aren't any seats except for the one next to that man, he must be saving it for someone. He's got a newspaper on it. Oh, I hate people who do that. I'll sit down on it anyway. Pardon me, mister. Do you mind if I sit here? But, uh... Thank you. I guess I showed him. <laughs> you know, mister, that newspaper of yours makes a nice, soft seat. Well, it should. I have a chocolate pie wrapped up in it. <laughs> I tried to warn you. Well, you have a lot of nerve doing a thing like that. Who do you think you are, anyway? My name is Vincent Price. I don't care who you are. You ought to be ashamed of yourself slipping a chocolate pie under me when my back is turned. Madam, Jack, this man has humiliated me. As my escort, I want you to give him a punch in the nose. Well, he, he's kind of big. Well, that doesn't frighten me. If you're half a man, you'll defend me. Now, go ahead. Give him a punch in the nose. Give him a punch? All right. Right, sir. Uh, how would you like to have a punch in the nose? I wouldn't. I offered it to him, me, but he doesn't want it. <laughs> Say, you're Jack Haley, aren't you? What are you doing here? I came over to learn how to play an instrument, and you? I'm here to learn how to play the guitar. Why do you want to learn how to play the guitar? Well, I have to know how to play it for my next role in pictures. You see, I'm going to portray a psychopathic hillbilly. <laughs> Psychopathic hillbilly? What has a hillbilly got to go nuts about? <laughs> Did you ever hear hillbilly song? <laughs> oh, that isn't what's driving me crazy. In the picture, I go crazy because I'm frustrated. About what? Well, I see all the pretty things in the Sears Roebuck catalog, but I don't know how to write, so I can't send away for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's maddening. Hey, what instrument are you here to study, Haley? I'm here to learn to play the ukulele. The ukulele? Yes. Oh, you kid. 23 skidoo and razzmatazz. The ukulele. <laughs> Come back here, you. You can't do that to me. The nerve of that guy. What are you so excited about? He laughed at me, and nobody laughs at Jack Haley. You hear me? Nobody laughs at Jack Haley. How true, how true. <laughs> well, never mind. I'm going through with this as soon as Nelson comes back. I'm going to insist on his giving me my first lesson. In the meantime, I better call the store and see how things are. Yes, I will. Whoops, almost missed that there. That's the first segment of the Seal Test Village store uh, from uh, March 20th of 1947 with Jack Haley. This is Chuck Shaden. We'll get back to that in uh, just a minute. Before we do, I want to remind you that you can subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide right now if you call us at 545-2260. Articles from and about the past, plus a lot of good reading and good information about the programs that we offer you every Saturday afternoon. 545-2260, a one-year subscription, just $7, and you can subscribe right now. Our listings, <coughs> by the way, we have our listing of our Saturday Those Were the Days programs. We give you lots of information about the uh, various programs that we schedule within our four-hour period here. Names of cast members and stars, sponsor identification, a line or two about the content of the show, even the times of each segment. Uh, for example, nine minutes and 50 seconds, for example, uh, in case you're taping shows for your own collection so you know when uh, to start the tape. If you're watching with a stopwatch or your regular watch, you can just check it out and get the whole thing together. Uh, 545 2260. That's the number to call to subscribe to our nostalgia newsletter and radio guide. A one year subscription, 10 issues, only $7. If you call now, we'll begin your subscription with the September issue. We'll get it out to you at the beginning of the week, right after the holiday, and we'll send you an invoice with your first issue. 545 2260. If you like, just send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But if it's easier, why not give us a buzz now at 545-2260. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Wilmette. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where convenience is important, and so are you. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop.
Many fine stores open to serve you seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. Now let's get back to Jack Haley and Company at the Seal Test Village store. <laughs> Hello, Seal Test Village Store. John Lang speaking. Oh, hello, Jack. Yes, everything's okay here. I had to order more Seal Test milk. It should be here any minute. Okay, Jack. Goodbye. Ah, here comes the Seal Test milkman now, singing as usual. Our milk has won the claim. You've all heard of its fame. But I have the darndest time remembering its name. <laughs> I guess they keep you pretty busy these days, don't they, Joe? Oh, sure. Everybody wants extra milk during Lent. Well, that's understandable. Lenten meals are a problem for housewives. Lots of meals have to be meatless meals, yet they still must be appetizing and nutritious. That's where Seal Test milk comes in. There are dozens of ways it can be included in every meal. And because it is nature's most nearly perfect food, it brings rich nourishment as well as delicious flavor to every dish. Yes, wise homemakers order extra milk during Lent. They use it liberally in soups and sauces, on cereals and desserts, in cooked dishes of every kind. And millions of them insist upon seal test milk, one of the world's fine milks. They know that it's famous for rich, creamy flavor, for fresh, wholesome taste. They know that it's laden with health-building vitamins, minerals, and protein, and that its purity is protected by rigid laboratory controls. So during this Lenten season, why not order extra milk for mealtime use? And always, for fine, pure, wholesome milk, order Seal Test, the measure of quality in milk. The singing star of our program, Bob Stanton, brings you the new ballad, Maybe You'll Be There. Bob Stanton. Each time I see a crowd of people Just like a fool I stop and stare It's really not the proper thing to do But maybe you'll be there I go out walking after midnight Along the lonely thoroughfare It's not the proper place to look for you But maybe you'll be there You said you're on You said your lips were mine alone to kiss Now after all those things you told me How can it end like this Someday if all my prayers are ready With anxious heart, I'll hurry to the door, and maybe you'll be there. Oh, Bob Stanton, that was great. Say, Eve, I wonder where that Nelson guy is. I'm anxious to get started with my music lesson. Oh, Jack, why don't you forget it? I doubt if you'll ever learn oh, how to play anything. Oh, you're still here, Haley. If you still insist on learning the ukulele, I have just the man who can teach you. Good. Who is it? The famous Viennese teacher of stringed instruments, Professor Schnitzel. Oh, here he comes now. He's a wonderful teacher, but he's a little nearsighted. Please don't mention it to him. He's very sensitive about oh, it. Oh, I won't mention it. Oh, Professor, would you mind coming over here? Oh, I'll be right there as soon as I finish with my viola lesson. 
Uh, put on some fresh lipstick, Viola. I'll come back later for the message. <laughs> uh, this is our famous teacher, Professor Schnitzel. How do you do, Professor? Uh, I hear voices. There's somebody here, maybe? I... Uh, I'm here, Professor. I... Oh. Yes, I came over to learn how to play the ukulele. <laughs> what kind of instrument is that from, anyway? <laughs> you should take up something with a bissel more schmalz. Why don't you learn to play the instrument what I play? Uh, I don't believe you know how to play anything. Please, you're speaking in the face of the world's greatest tangerine player. <laughs> Tangerine? You mean tambourine. A tangerine is an orange. Yeah, and you should hear the music I squeeze out of there. Check. Why don't you take up the tangerine? <laughs> and that you could play good anchors away. You think so, Weber? <laughs> yeah, providing it's a navel orange. <laughs> Professor, I don't want to study anything but the ukulele. Jack, why don't you forget the ukulele and take up something else? No, no, please, lady, make up your mind there what you want to play. I have no time to listen to you two dumb cops while you shilly shally. Now, wait a minute. Why a shilly? I'm speaking to shally. <laughs> I waste no more time on you. Goodbye. Hey, Nelson, what's the idea of sticking a character like that on us? That guy couldn't teach anybody anything. What do you mean he can't teach anybody anything? He's one of our best teachers. He just finished giving Vincent Price a lesson. Ask Mr. Price what he thinks of it. Oh, here he comes now. I will ask him. Hey, Vincent, I hear you've been studying with Professor Schnitzel. Did you learn anything from him? Yeah, I pick up a few things here and there. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm never going to learn to play the guitar in time for my hillbilly picture. Vincent, how come they gave you a hillbilly role? You're so miscast. You speak such perfect English, and you're so romantic looking. You're so handsome and dashing and debonair. Hey, it's that true. <laughs> Then why are they making you play one of those barefoot hillbillies? Oh, I don't know, unless it's because my nude feet are so photogenic. <laughs> if I say so myself, I have tantalizing tootsies. <laughs> you know, Vincent, if you play this part right, you might win the Academy Award for the best arch-supporting role. <laughs> Surely you don't like playing a hillbilly, Vincent. Oh, I don't mind playing a hillbilly but it's the psychopathic angle I resent. I'm tired of being a screwball. <laughs> oh, Mr. Haley. Oh, it's Nelson. What do you want now? I found an instructor who's willing to teach you the instrument you want. Joey, this is Mr. Haley. Why, you're just a little kid. What can, I, what can a kid this young teach me? What does he know about music? I'm uh, well versed in harmony, counterpoint, chromatic scales, and symphonic interpolation. How can he teach me music when he can't even talk English? <laughs> What's your name, Sonny? Joey Preston. Oh, I think you're cute, Joey. How old are you? I'm nine years old. I think you're cute, too. How old are you? <laughs> yes, I am cute, ain't I? <laughs> hey, Joey, you go over there and sit down and play for Mr. Haley. Wait till you hear him, Haley. He's a sensational drummer. Drummer? I don't want to learn the drums. But Joey Preston is terrific on the drums. You can see him play the drums in this week's current Paramount Newsreel. I'm only interested in the ukulele. It's practically the same thing. <laughs> Go ahead, Joy. Beat it out, son. Beat it out.
Oh, wasn't he terrific? Joey plays the drums professionally. All the money he makes, he gives to his family. I got an eight-year-old nephew who plays the drum, too. All we get from him is a headache. <laughs> That's another segment there of the uh, Seal Test Village store starring Jack Haley and Frank Nelson and all these other folks in there, too. It's a good show. I'm Chuck Shaden, happy to be with you every Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 here on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. We'll get back to the Village store in just a bit. When this tune was popular back in 1931, Norm Nelson and Ralph Hirschberg opened their Ford Automobile Agency on a small piece of land at 5133 West Irving Park Road. That first year, they sold about 100 new Fords. Today, 47 years and thousands and thousands of new Fords later, Nelson Hirschberg Ford occupies a whole city block at the same location on Irving Park at Laramie. Thousands of Chicagoland families have not only bought their first Ford from Nelson Hirschberg, but have returned again and again for all their new Fords. The proof is in the seeing. Next time you're out for a drive, notice how many Fords bear the Nelson Hirschberg emblem. And you'll notice how many drivers have seen Nelson Hirschberg one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers. 5133 West Irving Park Road at Laramie. Open Monday through Friday till 9, Saturday till 5. Now let's return to Jack Haley from uh, his role in the Tin Man of the Wizard of Oz to his role as proprietor of the village store. Mr. Nelson, I don't want to nag you, but it's imperative that I learn to play the guitar for my role in this hillbilly picture. Uh, see me later, Place. I'm busy now. Why is it so necessary that you learn to play the guitar for this picture? Well, it's important to one of the themes. In this scene, I sing and play a hillbilly song. You sing hillbilly songs, too? This I gotta hear. Tell me all about it. Very well. The picture's about a... Oh, wait till I answer the phone first. Hello, Seals has Village Store. I mean, Jack Haley speaking. Who's calling, please? <laughs> Interrupted, Vincent. What's the scene you were describing? Well, the scene takes place in a hillbilly's cabin high in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm a setting by the fireplace brooding, and my ma and pa are talking about me. <laughs> ma, I'm worried about our boy Vinny. He's acting a little peculiar lately. I know, Pa. The doctor feller said Vinny's the sensitive type, and he's going a little nuts. Can't, can't understand it. He's a fine-looking boy. Looks just like me, Ma. I know. That's what's driving him nuts. <laughs> but when he sings, he's all right, Pa. I'm going to ask him to sing the Blue Tail Fly. Don't do it, Ma. Once he gets started on that thing, he sings 98 choruses. Quiet, Pa. Vinny, will you sing the Blue Tail Fly for me in your golden voice, son? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I'll sing it with my four Ozark brothers, Manny, Moe, and Jack, and Jody. When I was young, I used to wait on the master and give him his play, and pass the bottle when he got dry, and brush away the blue tail fly. Jimmy Crack Horn, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Horn, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Horn, and I don't care. The master's gone away. That's a plenty, son. No. One day he riding round the farm. The flies so numerous they did swarm. One chance to bite him on the thigh. The devil take the blue tail fly. The pony run, he jump, he pitch. 
He threw my master in the ditch. He died and the jury wondered why. The verdict was the blue tail fly. Jimmy cracked corn and I don't care. Jimmy cracked corn and I don't care. Jimmy cracked corn and I don't care. My master's gone away. That's enough, son. Now you get They laid him under a cinnamon tree. His epitaph is there to see. Beneath this stone I'm forced to lie. The victim of the blue tail fly. Give me crack corn and I don't care. Uh, Give me crack corn and I don't care. Give me crack corn and I don't care. The master's gone away. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) shoot. I hate to keep a shooting at your son. You've got to stop shooting holes in our boy, Pa. (laughs) He ain't got so many holes in the maw. The heck he ain't. Last night, I mistook him for a sieve and strained the soup through him. (laughs) You leave our Vinny alone, Paul. I like the songs you learned in school, Vinny. You sure do turn a pretty phrase. Thanks. I bet you're glad you sent me to UCLA. (laughs) Yeah, mighty proud of you, son. Thanks, Paul. I'm not your pa, I'm your ma. You're always getting us confused. Well, it ain't my fault you look so much alike. One of you gotta shave off your beard. (laughs) Paul, I want to talk to you. What about, boy? The fellas down at school are talking about women. What's a woman, Paul? <laughs> Son, you ain't been going to UCLA. <laughs> I ain't a Joshin, Paul. What's a woman look like? Ask your ma. She saw one once. <laughs> oh, it's time you talk to our son, man the man. Yeah, yeah, guess so. Gotta have a drink first. Where's my jug? On your shoulder. How'd it get there? Don't you remember? We had it grafted on. (laughs) Now, son, I'm going to tell you all about the birds and bees. Oh, the heck with that, Pa. Tell me about women. (laughs) Okay, but I'm warning you. I know more about the birds than the bees. (laughs) Yeah, I guess you're too old to know much about women and romance, Pa. What do you mean? I'm as romantic as ever was. And I still got an eye for a pretty face. That's why I'm sitting here a spoon and a kissing with your ma like this. Oh. Look. That's the goat you're kissing. <laughs> Ma's over there. Mm, I thought she was wearing a better perfume, eh? <laughs> I can't stand hanging around this place anymore, Pa. We ain't got nothing here. Well, uh, tell us what you want and I'll get it for you. I want a bathtub. What's your language, son? Your mother's present. <laughs> And another thing, why can't I wear shoes? What, and hide your tantalizing tootsies that you're talking about? <laughs> and another thing, I want some of them modern conveniences of life. I'll never be content in this place. I've got to get out of here. I'll go mad, mad, mad. Easy, boy. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get to the big city, any big city. Calm down here. Let me out of here. I'm going to you, hear me? Up, I'm up. going out in the world and get me Down-a-go. some wine, women, and song. Wait till I get my head. I'll go with you. <laughs> I'm going, do you hear me? This place is driving me crazy, crazy. Do you hear me? Crazy. <laughs> hmm, nice and quiet around here, ain't it, Paul? Our Vinnie went nuts, Paul. What'll we do? Guess we better put him in the circus. The only man I ever knew could talk through a door like that. <laughs> Hand me that guitar, Ma. Here's what we'll do. We'll sing his favorite song. Ready? A1, A2. Vinny is cracked, crack, but we don't care. Vinny is cracked, but we don't care. He ain't got nothing under his hair. The man took him away. For 35 years, the Campfire Girls have been building responsible citizens and efficient homemakers through their program of learning by doing. Seal Test extends a cordial salute to this great character-forming organization on the occasion of its 35th anniversary. 
Be sure to join us next week when Seal Test Milk and Ice Cream will present proprietor Jack Haley with manager Eve Arden, Bob Stanton, Frank Nelson, Bob Jellis, and Hans Conrad, and as our special guest next week, Charlie Ruggles. Vincent Price appears through the courtesy of Universal International Studios, where he is currently working in their production, Jeopardy. Field Test Incorporated and associate companies are divisions of National Dairy Products Corporation. This program is written by Ray Singer and Dick Chevrolet and is produced by Robert L. Red. Thursday night is another all-star night on NBC. Stay tuned for Abbott and Costello over most of these stations. This is John Lang speaking to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The Seal Test Village Store, starring Jack Haley with uh, his guest star Vincent Price, plus Eve Arden, Hans Conried, and Frank Nelson. Broadcast from March 20th of 1947 on NBC. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago FM 97. You'll find us here every Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 with all the good old radio shows. Every Saturday night, you'll find us over at Northwest Federal for our memory movie, and our movie tonight is actually two movies, a double uh, double feature. Tonight we have Western Night, Destry Rides Again from 1932, starring Tom Mix, riding his way into your hearts, and uh, the boss of uh, Hangtown Mesa from 1942 with Johnny Mac Brown and Al Fuzzy Knight. Dollar and a quarter will get you in, and the, do uh, the proceeds of your donation will be given to recognized charities. Why don't you come on over and see these uh, two good uh, Western flicks from not so long ago. We'll be there. We hope that you will join us for that, too. On your way over to uh, uh, the Memory Club, the Memory Movies at Northwest Federal, you may want to stop at our uh, Metro Golden Memory Shop. You'll find that it's filled to the brim with great reading material about the good old days, uh, a lot of records, too, and tapes and all kinds of things. But as far as the books are concerned... If your interest is in radio, television, or movies, you'll find some great books at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. Uh, listen to these titles. The Pictorial History of Television, The Men Who Made the Movies, Saturday Afternoon at the Bijou, A Pictorial History of Radio, The MGM Stock Company, The RKO Gals, The Slapstick Queens, Pictorial History of Tin Pan Alley, Great Movie Shorts, Warner Brothers Presents, Paramount Pretties, Superman, Batman and Robin, Wonder Woman, Laurel and Hardy. We have them all, and they're waiting for you at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Come on in and browse, because uh, we're open seven days a week, Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Saturday from 10 to 7.30, and from noon to 5 every Sunday afternoon. Books, records, tapes, gifts, games, goodies for everyone at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. You can use your Visa or Master Charge uh, card at our MGM shop, too. Now, to wrap up our look at the talents of uh, so many talented people who were in the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz, we're going to 1948 uh, for a Kraft uh, Music Hall program starring Al Jolson. This is an excerpt from the broadcast of September 30th of 1948 with Al Jolson and his guest, the star of The Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. Oscar, what little girl does that song remind you of? Georgie Jessel? <laughs> Be careful, Oscar, or your summer layoff may be held over. <laughs> now, pay attention. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. Oscar, what little girl does that remind you of? Oh, uh, Luella Parsons. <laughs> Her name happens to be Judy Garland. <laughs> Judy, I knew it was you the minute I heard you sing Over the Rainbow. Oh, well, Al, you know, when I first sang that song, I was a little girl who believed that at the end of the rainbow there was a pot of gold. Yeah. Isn't that a silly idea? Not so silly. You're standing next to the pot right now. <laughs> well, Oscar, Oscar, don't you dare talk to Al like that. That's telling him, Judy. I've admired Al ever since I was a little girl. That's telling him. And my grandmother admired him when she was a little girl. 
You told him enough. <laughs> Actually, I don't usually talk that way about him, Judy. We're good friends. Why, every half hour I spend with Al Jolson is the happiest ten years of my life. <laughs> hmm. I, d I don't want to change the subject, but have you boys seen any good pictures lately? <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Judy. I forgot to ask you this thing. You, you see, whenever we get to talk about Al Jolson, I, I sort of lose myself in the subject, you know. <laughs> good idea, Al. Get lost. <laughs> I want to hear a song from Judy's newest picture, Words and Music. Oh, which one shall I sing, Oscar? Sing as many as you like. When anyone starts singing on this program, they never stop. <laughs> Whomever does he mean? <laughs> Judy, how about singing Johnny One Note, huh? All right, Al. All right, boy. Johnny could only sing one note, and the note he sang was this. Oh, Johnny One Note sang out with gusto and just overloaded the play. Poor Johnny One Note yelled willy-nilly until he was blue in the face. For holding One Note was his aid. Couldn't hear the brass, couldn't hear the drum. He was in a class by himself by gun. Poor Johnny One Note got in Aida. Indeed, a great chance to be brave. He took his one note, how like the north wind brought forth when that made critics brave. While Birdie turned round in his grave, couldn't hear the flute or the big trombone. Everyone was mute. Johnny stood alone. Don't stop yapping, lions in the zoo all were jealous of Johnny's big trill. Thunderclap, stop clapping, traffic ceased its roar, and they tell me Niagara's the still. He stopped the train whistles, boat whistles, steam whistles, cop whistles, all whistles, but I used to parade the other day, Judy, but I think I should have been the man to play the Fred Astaire part. Oh. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Oscar. You can't dance like Fred Astaire. Oh, no, that's right. I, I hear when the girls at Arthur Murray's see you coming, they wax the tops of their shoes. <laughs> you ain't kidding, Judy. <laughs> Oscar dances like an old lady with a bustle full of ice cubes. <laughs> well, don't you talk, Al. I've been at parties with you, and I've never seen you dance. No. But I'm a great sitter-outer. <laughs> anyway, you'll notice in my new picture that I do quite a bit of dancing. Yeah, that's the wonderful thing about your setup, Al. You can dance until Larry Parks' legs get tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, it so happens, Miss Garlin, yes. that I do my own dancing in this picture. Oh, what, 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 uh, what does Larry Parks do? He breathes heavily. <laughs> calling your new picture. I remember Mammy. No. <laughs> no, the title of my new picture is Jolson Sings Again. They ought to call it Try and Stop Him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be wonderful, Al, if sometime you and I could make a picture together? Yeah, between shots, you uh, could talk about your babies. Oh, that's right. You got a baby girl, haven't you, Judy? Yes, of course. She's two years old now. Uh, how old is your baby? <laughs> Here's a little picture of my baby. He's nine months old a day. And this morning he said the cutest thing. What did he say? Glug. <laughs> Gosh, the kid's only nine months old and he talks as well as his father. <laughs> Why not? I taught him. Oh, 
gee, when I was a little girl, I, I never dreamed that someday Al Jolson and I would be sitting around talking about our babies. Well, there's no business like show business. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, as long as we're talking about them, there's a little song about a baby and ain't exactly a lullaby. Well, come on, let's sing it out. Okay. Everybody loves a baby, that's why I'm in love with you. Pretty baby, Me? pretty baby. And I'd like to be your father, mother, dad, and brother too. Pretty baby, Me? pretty baby. Won't you come and let me rock you in my cradle of love? I'll love you all. The time. Oh, I want a loving baby, and it might as well be you. Oh, Asa. Pretty baby of mine. Pretty baby of mine. Come on, go to the food store. Be a wise shopper. Get plenty of Kraft's nutritious cheese food, Velveeta, enough for sandwiches and enough for cooking, too. The price of Velveeta is down, and actually smooth-melting Velveeta is one of the important protein foods, perfect for main dishes. And with Velveeta sauce, you can stretch and glorify a little leftover meat or chicken into another grand main dish. You simply melt one half pound of Velveeta in the top of the double boiler, then stir in one quarter cup of milk. There's a little recipe every thrifty homemaker should remember these days. A half pound of melted Velveeta to one quarter cup of milk for the glorious cheese sauce that transforms leftovers. Tomorrow, get plenty of smooth melting Velveeta. Irving Burling's greatest song, When I Lost You. I lost the sunshine and roses. I lost the heaven of blue I lost the beautiful rainbow I lost the morning dew I lost the angel who gave me Summer the whole winter through I lost the gladness That turned into sadness When I lost This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Seems like Al Jolson and Judy Garland had so much fun there that uh, they just ran out of time uh, for Al's closing song. That was the last segment of the uh, Kraft Music Hall, an excerpt from the uh, Jolson program from uh, September 30th of 1948 with uh, Al's guest star, Judy Garland, who was Dorothy. Can you think of Dorothy's last name in The Wizard of Oz? What was Dorothy's last name? Dorothy Gale? Dorothy Gale, I think it was. And she was caught in a tornado over Kansas that lifted her and carried her to the the land of Oz, somewhere over the rainbow. It's a fantastic film, and we were happy to share with you this afternoon some of the sounds, the radio sounds, of the people who appeared in The Wizard of Oz, uh, the 1939 MGM film. Judy Garland, Ray Bolger, Jack Haley, Bert Lahr, Frank Morgan, and Billy Burke. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago, FM 97. For the next two Saturdays, the 9th of September and the 16th of September, we're going to be having um, these radio shows for you. Danny Kay, uh, Red Skelton, Al Jolson, and the Kraft Music Hall, a complete show there with Jimmy Durante on the uh, 9th of September and with uh, Vera Vig on the 16th of September. We'll have a complete David Harding counter-spy adventure the Postal Pirates. We'll start that adventure next Saturday and wrap it up on the 16th. We'll have the first two shows in the 1935 comedy series Stoop Nagel and Bud. And then we have a, uh, a couple of good Eddie Cantor shows for you, too, with uh, Billy Burke is on the uh, Cantor show, and so is uh, uh, so are Abbott and Costello. So a lot of good things coming up in the next two weeks. 
And then on the uh, 23rd and 30th of September, we'll have Radio for Champions. We're going to have um, 24 consecutive episodes of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, one of the greatest of the after-school radio program, sponsored by Wheaties Breakfast of Champions. We have collected this series of consecutive Jack Armstrong adventures from um, October Monday, October 2nd of 1939, through Thursday, November 2nd of 1939. Uh, the complete adventure is essentially complete in those 24 episodes. And that means we have all of the episodes, but uh, in those days, uh, one story didn't just end on Friday and a new one started on Monday. There was kind of an overlapping and interesting segue of, of the adventure. But we'll have a whole story for you. It's the Zamboanga adventure in the life of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, coming up on two Saturdays, two consecutive Saturdays, the 23rd and the 30th of September, on Those Were the Days. And that's about it for today now. The old clock up on the studio wall says it's time to go, but we'll be back again next Saturday from 1 to 5 with more of our nostalgic sounds. Our thanks to Mort Paradise, Dennis Bubaz, Joel Bogart, and Gary Schroeder for their help behind the scenes. To our sponsors, Northwest Federal Savings, Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and Eden's Plaza Shopping Center for making this weekly get-together possible. And to you out there in Radio Land for making it worthwhile. This is Chuck Shaden speaking. Have a nice weekend, a nice, long, safe weekend. If you're going to do any driving, be very, very careful this weekend. And maybe we'll see you tonight in the memory movie at Northwest Federal Savings for the double feature of Westerns, Destry Rides Again from 1932 with Tom Mix and The Boss of Hangtown Mesa from 1942 starring Johnny Mac Brown, Al Fuzzy Knight, and Fred Heff. Thanks for listening. Nice to know that uh, someone noticed my initial outing in show business. You're listening to WNIB in Chicago at 97 FM. Orson Welles for Vivitar. I've discovered a camera, the Vivitar. It's a pocket camera with a great idea. The electronic flash is built in. So now my flash pictures don't have to be blurry or fuzzy because somebody moved, or because I moved. The Vivitar flash stops the action. What you get is just what happens, and you get it sharp. You don't have to pose, and you won't miss a picture looking for something to attach. That's the idea I like so much. There's nothing to attach. And the Vivitar pocket camera is small, inexpensive, and so easy. The flash is built in. If you want sharp, natural pictures, this has got to be your camera. The Vivitar. Vivitar cameras are available at General Camera Company, Chicago's friendliest camera stores, on the main floor of the Merchandise Mart and 4020 North Cicero, also at the corner of Devon and Western. Time now is one minute past five o'clock, and this is Fred Heft, former Western star, speaking and inviting you to stay tuned for Zephyr. Zephyr is a two-hour program of shorter, mostly lighter classical music, which we present each day of the week on WNIB between five and seven. Tonight in our first hour, we have music uh, by Johann Strauss, Jr., by Richard Strauss, by Chopin and Dvorak, and then in hour number two, between six and seven, music of Saint-Saëns, Beethoven, and Rossini. Music first uh, by various members of the Strauss family, the Johann Strauss family, that is. We'll hear Bal de Vienne, a ballet suite arranged and orchestrated by Douglas Gamley, intended for use in the second act of the Johann Strauss Jr. operetta Die Fledermaus. The ballet itself uh, consists of uh, tunes drawn from the works both of Johann Strauss Jr. and Sr. and of Josef Strauss. The National Philharmonic Orchestra is conducted by Richard Bonning. <laughs>
de Vienne, a ballet sequence arranged and orchestrated by Douglas Gamley from the works of Johann Strauss Jr., Sr., and uh, from those of Joseph Strauss. Played by the National Philharmonic Orchestra, Richard Bonning conducting. This is WNIB in Chicago at 97FM and Zephyr, our early evening program. Hello, I'm Martin Bookspan the commentator for the New York Philharmonic Broadcast Concerts. And I want to invite you to come along with me on my annual European Music and Opera Tour. It leaves Chicago on October 22nd, and we'll be attending 12 great performances of opera, symphony, and ballet in London, Hamburg, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Munich, and Paris. We'll be staying at fine hotels throughout, and most meals will be included. We'll also do lots of sightseeing, and we'll have our own special guide all along the way. You can come for 16 days or 22 days, and with nearly everything included, the cost is probably less than you would expect. If you would enjoy live performances by some of the greatest singers, orchestras, and soloists, come with me this fall to Europe. For a complete brochure, call WNIB at 337-5252 or write WNIB, 12 East Delaware, Chicago, Illinois, 60611 and ask for your brochure. We have next uh, two of the vocal numbers from Johann Strauss Jr.'s Deflator Mouse. First... From Soprano Rita Strike, the laughing song, Mine Here Marquise, and then from uh, Leontine Price, we'll hear the Chardas Klinge der Heimat. 